Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, uh, just it's my uh, my first transatlantic uh, meeting since uh, COVID nineteen. So I'm very 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 pleased uh, to see you all. I've missed you guys uh, for three years now. So thank you very much for being here. I think uh, uh, COVID-19, you know, made a hole in our lives, but yet uh, there were developments going on. So it's not that nothing happened in uh, companies and in uh, universities and other research places. So I think we have exciting uh, uh, news today. Uh, we have a session at the end for questions and discussion, but also in the meantime, if something is not clear, you can just speak up. I think it's a low profile session, uh, right? Because uh, Dr. Tizar is going to be uh, speaking about a difficult subject, I think. And I think uh, since we are all uh, fresh in the morning, we'll start with him. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Tizar, and he has been working on uh, different subjects, uh, and one of which is uh, brain organoids in vanishing white matter, which is uh, very exciting. So I would give you the mic. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and certainly want to first start uh, by thanking Marjo for the opportunity to be part of, of this community. Um, I don't know most of you, and hopefully that will change uh, o over the next uh, com coming uh, days and months and years. And so my name is Paul Tizar. I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University uh, in, in the School of Medicine. Uh, so I'd like to just introduce a little bit about myself first. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what my lab has done there for the past 12 years uh, and, and why I'm standing here today um, with, with some data to share uh, to, with you on vanishing white matter disease. Uh, so I grew up in Cleveland. I did my graduate work in, in England uh, at Oxford, and then I moved back three miles from, from where I grew up. And so I uh, have had the lab there for about 12 years, and we focused on the ability to um, try to regenerate oligodendrocytes uh, in, in the central nervous system. And so I want to talk just quickly about the cell types uh, in the brain that we're going to be thinking about a, a little bit today. Uh, and so, of course, the first and, and, and most important, uh, at, at least to me, is, is in this cartoon here uh, in green. Which is, which is the oligodendrocyte. And so the oligodendrocyte, as many of you may know, is, is a cell that provides a protective coating around nerve cells to enable uh, effective transmission of signals along the neurons. And so those nerve cells, of course, are the information superhighway, and the oligodendrocytes are essential. And what's important for today's talk is that these oligodendrocytes uh, generate this protective coating, and this protective coating is is fatty and and lipid filled, and so uh, it looks it looks white, right? And so in vanishing white matter disease, we're talking about the loss of these oligodendrocytes, which create this this fatty coating around around nerve cells. And so, what what has my lab done, and why am I why am I here today? And so, for for the past twelve years. We've really focused on the ability to, to use stem cell technologies to be able to, to grow cells in the laboratory at high scale and purity from, from many different patient populations uh, and to be able to grow them in a petri dish and to study them uh, in ways sometimes for, for the first time. Now, normally these cells are locked inside uh, all, of, all of our brain, so it's been a challenge. And so these technologies that have emerged from our lab and others over the past 10 years have really revolutionized our uh, neuroscience and the ability to study brain cells from patients in, in a completely new way. And so when we have those cells in the, in the Petri dish, it now allows us the opportunity to, to understand what's going on in, in, in normal development uh, in, in healthy patients. It allows us to understand potentially disease mechanisms for a variety of neurological disorders. And of course, it affords the opportunity for us then to, to discover and test different new therapeutics that might have an effect uh, to rescue the deficits that we uncover in these cells. And so I just wanna walk you through quickly uh, sort of two examples of what my lab has done over the past 12 years uh, and, and sort of give you, it'll give you some explanation of how we came uh, to start working on vanishing white matter disease. And then I'll share with you some brand new data that I've not talked about at any conference before um, where we've been able to, to, to really begin to model vanishing white matter disease uh, in, a, in a Petri dish in a human context. And please interrupt if you have questions, uh, if I say something that doesn't make sense. I'll leave some time for questions at the end, and I think there's also a, a larger session at the end of, 
of, of, of this portion of today's meeting uh, where we can discuss as well. So as I said, my lab is focused on building new cellular tools. Good, all right. And so what, what I just wanna show you here in this video that, that captures about 10, 10 years of work is that we were one of the first to develop the technology that allows us to grow uh, uh, and, and watch all gadendrocyte develop in real time in, in the laboratory. So in this video here, you can see the, these individual cells. These are, these are stem cells. And so you can watch now over time, the ability of these cells to now develop into all gadendrocytes in the laboratory, right? And so what this allowed us to do was for, in, in the context of a disease, multiple sclerosis, it allowed us to identify potential therapeutics that could enhance the generation of these oligodendrocytes. So we can grow hundreds and hundreds of millions of these cells and it allowed us to test tens and fifties of thousands of different uh, potential medicines for their ability to enhance the regeneration of oligodendrocytes as a potential treatment uh, for, for multiple sclerosis. We published a number of big uh, papers. You send those to mom. She's very, very happy. Um, and the exciting part is this is now you know, moving on uh, towards patients. We have a startup company, Canvelo Therapeutics, that's currently partnered with, with Genentech to advance these therapeutics uh, into the clinic for multiple sclerosis. So how does this relate to leukodystrophies? And so we had these exciting technologies that allowed us to, to grow and visualize uh, all gonendrocytes in the laboratory. And so we, we started working on Plasius Merzbacher disease uh, in uh, ab about 2014. And uh, the reason we started working on Plasius Merzbacher disease is the PMD Foundation had, uh, had a pilot grant and as a young faculty member, uh, you, you work on the diseases that you think that you're interested in, but also the diseases that you can get funding for. And so they had a, they had a small pilot grant. I applied and, and we got it. And we, we focused our technologies and our efforts on beginning to understand uh, Plasius Merzbacher disease uh, you know, using our, our, our technologies. And I'm going to just show you a snapshot uh, again in this, in this video which what you'll see is the sort of healthy cells on the left will develop into all good endocytes. But what you'll notice on the right is the cells from uh, PMD models, they will start to form all good endocytes, um, but then those all good endocytes will just die, they'll pop, right? And so on the, uh, on the left, you can see the cells move around much more readily, they'll begin to develop. And you can see here on the right, you know, these cells will begin. Um, to die. And so it was, it was really these types of initial studies, this was the first of, of many, that really defined for us the time that these cells are, are dying. We did a lot of um, molecular studies in the laboratory to, to define why they were dying. Uh, and so it, it really afforded us the opportunity to begin thinking about, okay, now we have a better understanding of when they die, why they die uh, in this particular disease. And it, it afforded us the opportunity to begin to think about developing potential therapeutics. And now I'll fast forward six years. Uh, we published a paper in, in 2020 where we had identified a way to modulate uh, those deficits uh, with an antisense oligonucleotide uh, drug. And I won't go through all the details here, but we identified uh, an antisense oligonucleotide drug in collaboration with, with Ionis. We showed in mouse models of Plasius Merzbacher disease, a severe mouse model of the disease that normally these mice only live for, for three weeks and we were able to fully extend lifespan out past 18 months uh, of age, restore all good endocyte numbers and restore um, motor function uh, to, to, the, to these animals. So it was a quite remarkable result for us uh, and, and very excited to say that this has now been licensed to, to Ionis and um, you know, we're all rooting for them to hopefully push this forward into the clinic. And so that's just a little bit of, of background on why I'm standing here today. As, as, um, as I said, I'm new to the vanishing white matter disease community. And so, so thank, thank you all for, for, for welcoming me and look forward to um, your continued interactions with, with families, both who are here in person, as well as uh, those listening online. And so what I wanna tell you now is the beginning of a story 
Uh, I told you sort of the three stages of the two previous stories for MS and for PMD, but I want to tell you the beginning of the story today and, and look forward to continued engagements with, with the leaders in, in the field, like Marjo and others, uh, to begin to, to continue to push this technology uh, forward. And so this project in my laboratory uh, has really been led by, by Ben Clayton uh, and Meyer Madvahan, who are uh, pictured here in, in the right, where we begin to look uh, at using our technologies to not develop um, looking at fl a cells flat in a Petri dish, but to look at these cells from vanishing white matter disease patients in a, in a slightly different way that I'll explain to you here uh, in a second. And so thus far, uh, we've, we've collected uh, uh, cells, other skin or, or blood from three separate uh, cohorts, the R113H uh, line over here uh, on the left, the, the most common mutation. Uh, we have uh, a line uh, from a compound heterozygote, meaning that there's two separate mutations in the IFTB5 gene, the common R113H and then the E81K. And then uh, a, a third cohort here from a patient with two um, two different mutations in the IF2B3 gene, um, uh, two variants of, of unknown significance here, uh, S14P and V385L. And so thus far, we've collected uh, samples from, uh, from these three uh, families, and we're, we're very excited uh, to be able to continue to do this from, from other families in the future. So what are, what are we doing? Right. So we've been able to generate stem cell lines, and so we can we can take either skin or blood uh, from from patients and the uh, the family carriers. Uh, we can we can generate uh, what are called iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells uh, in the laboratory. So these are perfect genetic match to each of these individuals. And then what we can do is um, we can take these induced pluripotent stem cells from from each of these individuals or patients. And we can generate uh, what we would call brain organoids. And so what are brain organoids? Well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell you what they are, but I'm gonna show you a picture first. So this is, this is actually me holding this, this flask of cells up here, right? So you can get a sense of, of scale. And you can see within this flask of cells, these individual white floating, floating pieces of, of tissue. And so these are millimeter size macroscopic pieces of, of human brain tissue that we've developed from stem cells in the, in the laboratory. But what's exciting about that is that you know, these, these brain organoids here are a perfect genetic match to the, to the patients from which they're derived. And so it allows us, excitingly, to, to, to be able to study and grow large quantities of, of brain tissue from individual patients uh, in the laboratory to to really begin to understand what's going on, can we see deficits, and then provides us opportunities to potentially test uh, therapeutics uh, either concurrently or before they might go into clinical trials. Okay, so what did we learn? And so from these three uh, patients thus far, I just want to share with you uh, our, our our, our data thus far on, are we able to see, question one, are we able to see any deficits that mimic what's going on in the course of the human disease? Uh, and, and if so, can, we, that, can that information begin to allow us to understand more about the disease? And are there potential interventions that we could test in these brain organoid models that might afford us an understanding of, of what's going on and whether or not there might be opportunities for therapeutic intervention in the future. So I'm just gonna walk you through some, uh, some actual data here, it's not too scary, and hopefully it's, it's uh, uh, easily digestible, but please ask questions uh, if not. And so I'll walk you through the, the three separate uh, uh, patient cohorts here. On the left, I'm starting with the R113H. You're seeing an image uh, all the way on the left uh, from, from the carrier and an image uh, on just to the right of that from the patient. Uh, it's hard to see on this particular screen. You probably can see it better on, on, on Zoom. But what we're quantifying here is, is the cells in, in red. Those cells are stained with a marker to look at oligodendrocytes. So now we're just, we're in this little macroscopic piece of brain tissue in a Petri dish, and we're asking, do the patients compared to their familial carriers, uh, do they have any reduction 
in the number of oligodendrocytes. And remember, this is vanishing white matter disease. So the question is, is there, are there less oligodendrocytes uh, in these brain organoids uh, in the patients? And so for the R113H cohort, the answer is, is, is overwhelmingly yes. You can see here quantified uh, on the bottom that there's, there's a 50 to 75% reduction in the number of oligodendrocytes in, in these organoids from, from the patient compared to the carrier. Now in the compound heterozygote uh, mutation, this is, um, uh, we see the same effect where quantified on the bottom and images on the top, you can see that there's you know, a 50 to 70% reduction in the number of oligodendrocytes that are present in the, that are surviving in these brain organoids in the laboratory uh, in the patient compared to the, uh, to the familial carrier. But interestingly, in the EIF2B3, which clinically is a, a, at least as far as a much more milder presentation of the, of the disease, we see no overt deficit in, in the number of oligodendrocytes present in, in these organoids uh, thus far. And so this, this is exciting for, for me as a, as a neurogeneticist because it allows us now to continue to expand this panel, to continue to look uh, at different genetic mutations in different families and, and begin to understand, is there a relationship between the number of oligodendrocytes that we see in the, in the laboratory in these organoids and, and the actual clinical presentation uh, of these patients. And so this is, this is early on, of course, that I think the data um, are, are quite striking, at least to, to us, but we have a lot of work to do to begin to expand this to more patients to understand if we can really um, you know, have a correlation between the clinical presentation and the deficits that we're seeing here in, in a Petri dish. Okay, so the rest of uh, the last few slides here, uh, I'm going to focus uh, largely on the R113H uh, cohort. But vanishing white matter disease is is known to where, where patients will have a hyperactivation of the of what's called the integrated stress response. So they have a they have an overactivated uh, response uh, to external stress, uh, which we think then causes the oligodendrocytes. Uh, to, to die, right? And that's what causes the white matter or to, to vanish in, in these patients. And so question one is, are we seeing an enhanced stress response in the Petri dish, in these organoids? Can we, can we model that portion of, of the disease? Um, and what was really exciting for us is, is the answer is, is yes. And so I'm just showing you a single marker here in green. What you're seeing in this picture Right, is four of those little organoids, and you're, you're, you're taking a cross section, so just a slice through each of them. And then we're putting a stain on here that allows us to visualize whether or not these cells have a, a, a sort of a hyperactivation of this, of this stress response. And you can see in the patient lines on the right, there's green everywhere. Right. There's a strong activation of this of the stress response, whereas in, in the carriers, very little. Right, and so this was really exciting for us because it says, you know, that we can mimic uh, in the lab uh, uh, this component of the disease, which which is which is, has been challenging to do in in other systems. And so this isn't just one marker. I'm not going to go through all of this on the right here, but we've looked at uh, hundreds or thousands of different markers, and you can see that in, in each case, every single one of them is up in the, the patient compared to the carrier. So there's a hyperactivation of the stress response in the patient organoids um, in the laboratory. Okay, well, we know that we see reduced numbers of oligodendrocytes. And we know that we see a, re uh, a hyperactivation of the stress response. Um, but what if we add molecules that others have, have identified that could potentially mitigate um, this, this stress response? How does that, does that have any effect in this organoid model in, in the laboratory? And so I'll show you two pieces of data on this slide and then one more piece of data on, on the next slide. 
And so here we're, we're treating with a small molecule uh, called, called ISRIB, uh, originally developed in Peter Walter's lab at UCSF and then advanced uh, now, now at, at, at Calico into a, a, a related molecule that is in phase one uh, clinical trials for, for a different indication. Um, but ISRIB is a modulator of that stress response that, that I showed you on the previous slide. And what you can see here in this image is, again, on the left, very little stress response in the carrier. The R113H uh, uh, organoids here have a hyperactivation of the stress response. But when we treat them with ISRIB, this, this um, uh, potential medicine, uh, we can see that we can abrogate, we can com almost completely reduce that, that hyperactivation of the stress response. Uh, and the same is true for protopidine, which is a sigma-1 uh, modulator that's currently in clinical development for Huntington's and ALS. Right, so we're able with, with potential medicines to be able to, to modulate or reduce that stress response in the patient organoids. And so the, the question then becomes, how does that affect the elegant endocyte numbers, right? Do, are we able, by, by reducing that stress response, are we able to, to rescue uh, or enhance the survival of the elegant endocytes uh, in, these, in these organoids? Um, and excitingly, the, the, answer, the answer is yes. And so you can see the pretty pictures uh, at the top, and we're looking again in red. Red is a stain marking the elegant endocytes in these organoids. So uh, the carrier has lots of red cells. There's uh, much reduced in the R113H uh, uh, organoids. And then the treatment with ISRIB, protopidine, enhances the survival of the algae dendrocytes in this in the system. And this is quantified here on the, on the bottom. So you can see the carrier uh, in, here on the left. And then in blue here, reduced in the patient. Uh, in green is treatment with ISRIB, and in purple is treatment with protopidine. So it's not completely back to 100% perfect wild type levels, but there is a substantial restoration of oligodendrocyte survival uh, in these samples by treating with these molecules that, that can reduce this hyperactivated stress response in these patients. And so that's really the data that we have uh, thus far. And so I just wanted to walk you through some of the key points that hopefully I uh, provided today. And then I'm happy to take questions now. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Happy for you to email me, um, give me a call, um, and we can walk through uh, any, any, any comments or questions that you have. So what I showed you today is that we've developed this new model of vanishing white matter disease that we think in, in parallel to the many other systems um, that have been, been developed, cellular systems, mouse models, and of course, clinical data, that this will now uh, continue to aid in, in our understanding of what's going on in this disease, uh, begin to allow us to study the different genetic variations in different patients uh, at, at, at higher scale, and collectively, all these models hopefully can converge uh, to begin to, to develop new therapeutics and allow us to test potential therapeutics for patients. And so I showed you that we've now thus far generated uh, these, these brain organoids from, from three patients. Um, and we'd, of course, be, be very uh, grateful for the opportunity to continue to expand this, this cohort and to perform these studies on additional patients and additional genetic variations. And the more and more information that we can glean will, will allow us to potentially in the future be able to predict you know, clinical trajectory, uh, be able to predict therapeutic response um, in, in the Petri dish, which would be pretty exciting. Now, I showed you that the organized system that we've developed mimics a number of key features of the human disease. I showed you that we see a reduced survival or reduced number of oligodendrocytes, the myelin-producing cells. We see a reduced number of those in the patient lines, at least from the R113H or from the AF2B5 uh, cohorts. And I showed you that we see an increased stress activation in the patients that we can modulate by treating with, with certain drugs, uh, namely ISRIB and protopidine. And that by modulating the stress response, we can enhance the survival of these algae dendrocytes 
uh, in these organoids, which I think uh, you know provides you know strong hope and rationale that uh, drugs that modulate this pathway might have similar effects in patients in the future. And so I'll I'll stop there. Uh, of course, um, I didn't uh, do, do uh, any of the work that I showed you today. I, I lead an amazing team uh, at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Uh, the work that I showed you today was was led by Ben Clayton and Meyer Madvahan in the lab. Uh, we've had a great collaboration with with Ali Fatimi, who was very instrumental in helping uh, set this up and acquire patient samples uh, in in the beginning. And in data that I didn't show you uh, today, uh, a lot of molecular analysis was aided by uh, Carmela Sadrowski in her lab at Calico. And of course, none of this work would be possible without uh, the families who have contributed samples, as well as the funding sources who have supported this work uh, o over the years, uh, in particular, the Walter family uh, for providing support to generate these organoids and characterize these organoids, uh, and hopefully this provides a foundation for us to continue to use this type of technology to study vanishing white matter disease. So I'm happy to take any questions now, or we can save them for the end of the session. So the EIF uh, to be three compound heterozygote patient, which has at least thus far uh, a much more mild clinical presentation, and I'm not a clinician, so I'm not going to speak to to clinical presentations uh, too much. But um, we have not seen a hyperactivation of the stress response in those organoids as of yet, right? And so what we're what we're doing now is to understand are there you know are there potentially specific triggers that may be hypersensitive in the different genetic backgrounds so you know are the r113h sensitive to xy but not z whereas the uh, yeah to be 3 compound heterozygous may be only sensitive to z or it may be it needs 10 times of x and y stress and so these experiments, which I, I didn't tell you about uh, in the beginning, take a really long time. So we're developing a piece of human brain tissue in, in the laboratory. So we grow these for hundreds and hundreds of days, sometimes uh, up to two years uh, to really get to a point where we think you know, the tissue has matured enough to be able to answer uh, some, some of these questions. And so you know, the experiments that we're doing now are beginning to try to test you know, specific extrinsic stressors and how they might um, affect the stress response and all get intersite numbers in different different genetic backgrounds. Uh, it was an, uh, a great talk and amazing work, Paul. Um, what I find uh, difficult always is to see how um, a culture model really models the disease and what's different. And uh, we have um, much autopsy tissue, so I think we have brains of something like 24 vanishing white matter patients, and there's actually always an oligodendrocytosis uh, to the degree uh, that they, it causes diffusion restriction on MRI. So, uh, the, the, or, and that all pathologists are thinking that it might be an oligodendroglioma. So we see actually in brain tissue uh, the reverse from what you see in culture. And I wonder how that can be or... Um, uh, how we uh, how perhaps the culture system can be adapted to more come more closely to uh, what we see in in vivo or in actually what we see closely. So yeah, I mean the the ability to compare data from you know from patients and from the system, uh, I think provides us you know an, a, a real opportunity to to begin to have additional insight into what's going on in this disease. And so I think what's important to remember here is this is this is the developmental system, right? And so we're we're looking at what is happening during the early development, right? And so how the 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 patient tissue is is from you know from from autopsy unfortunately, and so we're sort of looking at a, a response 
you know, we're looking at a response to the, to the early phases of the disease. And so, I, I mean, it would be a complete conjecture for, for how to align the, the two findings, but, you know, I think one, you know, one could think about, you know, a, an initial loss. I think there is an sort of an intrinsic delay in the, in the ability of, of vanishing matter disease, all genetocytes to form. I think they're hypersensitive to stress, but you can imagine a response to that would be to try to, you know, to try to generate a more, more of them. And so I, I think there, there could be alignment there, but if, you know, of course, the more you, you know, you and I could work together on this, the, the, there'd be opportunities to really put meaningful data around that. Be terrific. Go and wait. Sounds great. Yeah, either final session or uh, I'll, I'm gonna stick around uh, after so we can we can also chat then. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this community and look forward to continued interactions. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for coming uh, because I think you specifically came for uh, this session. Yep. So that's uh, really an honor for us that you came uh, to do that. Thank you so much. I was looking for the microphone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, again a great pleasure that uh, you are here. And I, I promised to update you on several subjects. So that's uh, what I'm going to do. Uh, this is my funding. It causes no conflict of interest. Um, would it be possible to remove? Because <laughs> I'm not seeing my own, own text. Um, we are holding a patent on uh, guanabans uh, treatment in vanishing white matter uh, for the University Medical Center in Amsterdam. I'm a consultant for Calico and a co-investigator on the Alexander disease trial for Ionis. So I'll briefly recapitulate uh, the disease. Um, the classic vanishing white matter disease has its onset between two and six years. And it's a disease of chronic decline, especially a motor decline and a less obvious cognitive decline. On top of that, next to the chronic decline, there are episodes of major decline, and de these are mo mostly provoked by febrile infections and head trauma. And they are accompanied by uh, irritability typically and lowered consciousness, sometimes coma, but patients may uh, 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 die or may also recover partially and sometimes completely. Patients die after a uh, variable number of years. Then we have the very early uh, onset vanishing white matter at the most of your end of the spectrum with an onset before the age of one. And those patients have no development, have a fast regression in, in terms of days to weeks. And they have severe epilepsy, irritability, and they die soon. There's also late onset vanishing white matter. And the latest onset I know of is in the 60s. And those patients typically have mostly cognitive decline and behavioral changes. And there is a variable disease progression because also those patients can undergo an acute decline. Is there also a laser pointer, you think? Otherwise, I'm going to be very, that's also fine. Uh, very uh, old-fashioned and point to it. What you see on the top left is uh, the age of onset and the distribution in a clinical natural history study that we did on vanishing white matter. And then you can see that by far most of the patients, two-thirds of the patients have an onset below six. Uh, these are Kaplan-Meier curves. For the, uh, and on the top is the survival, then ambulation, and then uh, cognition. 
and we divided the patients into six groups, onset below one, bet onset be uh, between one and two, then two and four, four and eight, eight and 18, and above 18. And what you see in the left column, uh, which are uh, the ages, that there's really um, a correlation between age and onset and disease scores. So function is lost later when the, uh, the onset is uh, also later. On the right, you see the same uh, survival, ambulation and cognition, but now for disease duration. So we now are looking at the speed of the disease. Then you can see that with onset below the age of one, it's a very, very fast disease. Patients die soon. And after that, uh, the disease becomes slower. And then from an onset of uh, age of four on, the rate of the disease becomes sort of the same. So there's no, it doesn't matter overall in a disease rate whether a patient had an onset at four or at 14. What I would like to show is that because the early onset patients die so soon, that the distribution of ages for the living patients is very different than for age of onset. This is our registry, and we have, uh, I think, 400 patients in the registry. And what you can see is that two-thirds are 16 years or older. And this is uh, something that's very important uh, uh, when you think about trials, that most patients who are living are older than 16 years. We also looked at individual disease courses uh, for the patients. And then you can again see those are HUI scores. Uh, that's a quality of life scores. And uh, that patients with an onset below one have an invariably very fast uh, disease scores. And then after that, it starts to spread out. So vanishing white matter is a very unreliable disease. You can be stable for years. And all of a sudden, patients uh, may go down. And even these low uh, spaghetti plots look like straight lines, but that, that's because we only had few uh, HUI assessments. If you have only two assessments, the line will be straight. But if you have multiple system, uh, assessments, as you can see here, then, the, then you can see that the patient is deteriorating, coming back, deteriorating, straight line, and then uh, deteriorating and coming back. And also the, in the green line, you can see that patients uh, all of a sudden uh, may die. This is uh, the MRI. And the pathology, and what you see on MRI, the normal T2-weighted image, this is a transverse section of the brain. You can see that the cortex is light gray, that the white matter then is dark gray, and that the CSF is white. On the bottom is the flare, and it has the same contrast between cortex and white matter, but the CSF, shown here, is black. What you see in vanishing white matter on the top is that from the beginning, the white matter is completely abnormal. It looks white and it remains white till the end. The thing is that white is also the CSF. So uh, the whiteness does not distinguish between abnormal and uh, CSF. So what you see on the bottom of the flare, you need a flare for that, that initially the white matter is abnormal, but present. And then you see that it starts to be darker. And in the end, it's indistinguishable from what's in the ventricle, so CSF. So the whole white matter has vanished. And at autopsy, you can see that there's a big hole here in the, in the white matter. And here it is uh, rarefied. So the, um, it's actually not a demyelinating disease. It's not specifically that myelin is lost. The whole structure of the white matter is lost. So axons go, everything goes. And that's also very important. If you think of remyelination, that would not work for vanishing white matter. You need more than that. Um, the defect is caused by uh, 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 variants in five genes, EIF to be one, two, three, four, and five, uh, most commonly in five. And together, they encode an enzyme, which is eukaryotic initiation of translation factor 2B, EIF to be. And that's a con an enzyme that's conditional for life. As you know, DNA is, trans, uh, is transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein. So this enzyme plays a role in expression of the genetic code DNA into protein. If EIF to be uh, is completely dysfunctional because of mutations and doesn't work anymore, there will be no life because uh, you need protein synthesis in order to survive. So what we typically see is mild, minor mutation, small mutation, just one amino acid change. 
And, and then uh, it causes a defect in uh, EIF2B activity. And what you would expect is that protein synthesis goes down. Um, EIF, now under stress conditions, protein synthesis needs to be downregulated. Because under stress conditions like febrile infections or other stress conditions, um, uh, the body needs to do something else but not synthesize new proteins because that's a very energy consuming process. And this regulation of decreasing protein synthesis under stress conditions is done by EIF2B. By EIF2B. So this also explains something of um, the sensitivity of the disease for stresses. So this is a, a complex representation of the integrated stress response. Here you can see the endoplasmic reticulum where proteins are uh, may, uh, get, getting their final shape. And, um, and um, uh, what you can see here is the stress factor. Uh, Double-stranded RNA is about viral infections, heme deficiency, fever, amino acid starvation, protein misfolding here in the endoplasmic reticulum. Those are all stress factors. And they, do this, they activate enzymes. And all these enzymes do the same thing. They phosphorylate EIF2 which is another factor, and then EIF2 tightly binds EIF2B, and by holding it, it decreases its activity, and there are two downstream effects. One is general protein synthesis goes down, I explained that, and the second thing is the ATF4 transcription response is activated, and that's a response that is activated in order to determine what the cell is going to do. The cell uh, may be repaired if the stress is copable, or just uh, the stress may be too long standing or too severe and the cell is going to die. So that's regulated through the ATF4 transcription response. And you can see that the ATF4 transcription response leads to many different factors. And there's also a feedback loop in it that's uh, mediated by CAT34 that restores uh, the normal ac activity of the integrated stress response. Now in finishing what matter, Um, EIF2B activity is always decreased. So the cell has the feeling it's always in stress because normally that would be uh, done by um, uh, activation of the upstream part of the integrated stress response. So in vanishing white matter, EIF2B activity is always decreased. Oh. And what you would think that uh, general protein synthesis would be down. Actually, we, don't ne we never see that. We only see it, I think, in very severely affected uh, neonates. They are small. And, but otherwise, uh, patients with vanishing white matter have a normal size. So I think protein synthesis is guaranteed. We never see anything wrong with protein synthesis. But the ATF4 transcription response, as just explained by uh, Dr. Uh, Tizar, is always activated. So this, this downstream part is always on. So cells always experience stress activity. This helped, this helped us a lot in thinking about uh, what you could do for uh, vanishing white matter. One is, of course, avoid provoking the ISR. Clearly, these are factors that you can see the patient is sensitive to. So that's fever, infections, head trauma, they need to be avoided. And um, we already said that in, 2000, in 2001 when we found the genes. And what I experienced over the year, the, the disease has become calmer. So we avoid episodes of acute decline by avoiding the provoking factors. That's not enough because the chronic disease still goes on. Uh, the, um, the other things we could do is reduce ISR activation upstream of EIF to B. So we could work on the endoplasmic reticulum and give, for instance, uh, chaperone molecules to, to facilitate uh, protein folding. We could also stimulate EIF2B activity directly because it's decreased in vanishing white matter, so can we restore it? And we can also think of modulating the integrated stress response downstream of uh, uh, EIF2B, so can we work on ATF4 or can we work on GAP34? And the fifth possibility is working here on the downstream effects of this abnormal activation of the, of the ISR. Um, I know I've told this before, so I'll be brief about it. Guanabens is an old alpha 2 adrenergic antihypertensive drug. It's introduced on the market in the late 80s, I think. 
It's FDA approved, it's no longer used because there are better antihypertensive drugs and it's not produced by any company. It's known to be safe because it has been used for decades. And the side effect is that it also impacts the ISR through what I pointed out, the GAP34 feedback loop, thus activating EIF2B indirectly. We have made uh, mutant mice. This is the EIF2B5 uh, mutant mouse, and that replicates the disease. If you give guanabans to the mutant mouse, the brain pathology becomes better, ISR activation goes down, motor performance is becoming almost normal. I think last year, uh, the last time I was here, I showed movies on which you can see the mouse walking on the catwalk, it becomes almost normal. And there's definitely a dose effect relationship. So if you dose higher in mice, uh, the effect is better. So the conclusion was that uh, perhaps we could re reuse guanabans in finishing wet matter patients. So that's what we did. Uh, we uh, initiated a phase one, two trial in finishing wet matter. And you may wonder why the phase one part, and that's because we are applying it in children and guanabans has only been used from uh, 12 years on. So we initiated an international monocenter trial. Um, we included patients with an early onset and still ambulant. And we did that because the early part of the disease is more predictable. So that we uh, decided to do an open label study and not have placebo controls. Which I think is in this fast, because we are focusing on the fast part of the disease, is unethical. You cannot just not treat the patient if you have something promising for two years. Um, uh, so um, we did that and um, we also said that the brain damage needed to be uh, reasonable because if the, the brain damage is very bad, it's not going to be repaired anyway. So then we would not see an effect. So we go for um, uh, rever uh, partly reversible brain damage and we got the funding um, uh, in place. So uh, also Vanishing Heart Matter Family Foundations and private donations made this trial possible. And the details are that we can max have uh, 40 patients. Disease onset needs to be below six, still able to walk 10 steps with at most mild support of one hand. The maximum disease duration can be eight years and there needs to be a reasonable travel distance to Amsterdam. And here COVID-19 uh, 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 helped us a lot. Because uh, initially there would be frequent visits to Amsterdam, but because of COVID-19, we filed an amendment and uh, the committee decided that we could replace the physical uh, visits to Amsterdam to video consultations. Um, and then it is uh, coming every year to Amsterdam and once in the three months, a video consultation. All patients. Wow. All patients stay in the trial uh, till the end, and that will be a total trial duration of uh, four years. The results on, until now are as follows. We started on May 31 last year, and uh, since then we have included 18 patients, and one patient stopped within three weeks because uh, the family found a disbalance between the burden of the trial uh, and uh, the ma very mild neurological deficit of the child. So this, uh, they decided not to participate. So actually this patient was never adequately dosed. Um, we have 10 males, seven females. Uh, they enter at a median age of eight years, but the range is two to 12. Disease duration at entering the trials is a mean three years, but we also have a patient um, uh, of uh, the disease onset started. The disease onset was one year before. Um, we, the minimum guanabans dose needs to be one milligram per kilogram per day. And we achieve that in all patients. All patients tolerate guanabans and have no major side effects. None of the patients experienced major neurological uh, deterioration until now, whereas they are early onset patients. So uh, they are stable. One patient lost ambulation during titration and was already marginal at inclusion. And of course, longer follow-up is needed to determine efficacy. All patients have side effects. And that's also um, that we knew that because we, were, um, we went for the maximum tolerated dose. And in order to know what's maximum tolerated dose, you need to, to dose up until patients have side effects. 
and then take a step back. So what patients experience are alpha-2 adrenergic side effects. They are sleepy, drowsy in the beginning, a dry mouth. They may feel unsteady when walking, may have tremor, constipation is common, nausea and vomiting, sad feelings, moodiness, vivid dreams are common, sometimes nightmares, and patients may have visual or tactile hallucinations. So guanabens is not, is, not is not a drug like paracetamol. It has side effects. The side effects uh, uh, resolve over a few weeks, but sometimes they come back transiently and then we have to deal with it. Sometimes we give extra medication like laxative for constipation, antiemetics, um, for the hallucinations, we sometimes give risperdon. And sometimes it helps if we split the total dose into two smaller doses. Until now, then patients all tolerate uh, the, uh, the um, guanabens. And so uh, apart from this first patient who, uh, from one patient who uh, dropped out during titration, none of the other patients dropped out. What we are planning, uh, I think that the trial uh, will have 40 patients by the end of next year. Um, we, as I said, we have a patent. It's granted in the USA and pending in the EU. And the, our aim is, if effective, we want to register it and make the, the drug available at cost price. And that's something that uh, we receive a lot of help for in the local pharmacy. Um, and we do that also for, uh, for other drugs, like for CGX. This is the trial team. Uh, as you can see, the vanishing web met the trial and the most important persons are Renate Verbeek on the left, she is the sub-eye. Then Marije Voormans is here and you may wish to see her. She's the trial coordinator and does an excellent job in making travel arrangements for everybody. Uh, Menno Stellingwerf um, um, manages the, our registry. Then we have trial nurses, we have pharma uh, pharmacists and Peter Wals is a MAR physicist. And we have some other pe people involved in uh, biomarker studies. This is not the end. Uh, there are EIF2B activators in Vanishing Web Matter. Um, they have been tested both by the group of Carmela Sidrowski and we have tested them. And they are extremely effective. They are highly promising. Um, they look safe. So short-term safety in healthy volunteers is known, and, and I think the number of healthy volunteers dosed uh, is high. But um, we don't know anything about safety in vanishing web matter patients, and no, there's no information on long-term safety. I'm happy to tell you that um, in another session, and perhaps some of you were there, Calico just announces uh, a phase 1b safety study for uh, vanishing white matter. So, um, and I think that will be by the end of this year, uh, uh, Calico will uh, endeavor the first safety study in vanishing white matter, and that will be on their website. And I'm coming back later to the vanishing white matter consortium. It will also be on the vanishing white matter consortium website because Calico will do that together with the vanishing white matter consortium. Other therapy options under development. Well, I've already mentioned some. Uh, chaperone molecules to reduce protein misfolding and ER stress. Um, Guanabens analog lacking the alpha-2 adrenergic uh, side effects would be wonderful. We're working on it. Drugs modulating EIF2B phosphorylation, thereby impacting its activity, are promising. Uh, drugs modulating ISR activation and ATF4 transcription response. Um, <coughs> would be wonderful. Together with uh, Ionis, we are working on antisense oligonucleotides to reduce e ATF4 or downstream components of the ATF4 transcription response. And we are working also on uh, gene therapy. You can see we are talking about an ultra rare disease and we have an explosion of therapeutic possibilities. So we saw this coming already a couple of years ago uh, because in, in the past, I had no attention at all from pharmaceutical companies. And then a couple of years ago, we had an overwhelming interest of pharmaceutical companies. So I thought we need to do something. And that's what we did. We formed an international consortium of vanishing by metaclinical experts. And these are the names, as you can see them uh, here. And we have been working now for two years together. Uh, and the aim of the consortium is to enhance trial readiness and govern 
uh, and facilitate trials. So we have a registry and uh, I would advise all patients to register. The registry um, will be discussed by Daphne Schoenmakers. And, but our most important point is we want uh, uh, to share control so that fewer patients are on placebo and, um, and that more patients can be treated and that we arrange everything very well so that uh, as many drugs can be tested as possible. That's uh, what we want, that's our aim. We are supported by the Industry Alliance Office, Priska Leverink. She is also here and she's going to talk later in the session. So she helps us with the interface between uh, researchers and, um, uh, and industries. In order to facilitate that, try, that uh, controls can be shared, you need to develop a core protocol that all, all uh, companies, all sponsors follow. So we have uh, we are in the process of developing three core protocols, one for 16 plus and one for six to 16 and one for the ages below, below six. And what you have to see is that uh, it's easiest for the patients above 16 because we know most of, we know many patients. And then for those patients below six, we only know a few patients. Um, for the older patients, we are aiming at randomized control trials. But for the third trial, for the below six, we are aiming at an open label trial. Because as I said, for very young patients with an aggressive disease course, I think it's not ethical to have uh, placebo controls. It will be a treatment period of, three, uh, of two years with open label extension. And the consortium will find that obligatory, no run in. And the aim is stabilization. Improvement is of course wonderful, but uh, uh, stabilization is also already great. Um, we only will include uh, DNA confirmed uh, diagnosis and uh, the, the disease has to be started. We are not working with uh, pre-symptomatic patients because you never know when the disease will then start. The patients need to be stable for at least three months and that's because if you just have an episode of decline, then uh, improvement belongs to the natural disease course. So uh, you, you need to be stable for uh, at least three months. And, you, and uh, we are also discussing the minimum neurological function because as I said, if the brain is totally devastated, there's no way you can bring that back by any treatment. So we are thinking of uh, being able to walk 10 steps with at most life support of both hands. So that's a little bit lighter than the Kwanabens trial and also setting a limit uh, to the IQ. And actually, for uh, it's here uh, for protocol three can sit with arms popping, but we are discussing having no minimum level for uh, the youngest patients and just go for uh, disease stability and development. So you can can hear from what I'm saying that it's still a work in progress, and we are discussing um, that with uh, with the consortium. The setup is that the, uh, uh, each sponsor spon is the sponsor of the own trial, free to choose CRO so, and go for ethics approval. So they are really separate trials, just following the core protocol. And so the core protocol is obligatory and sharing of control data is uh, uh, obligatory. Uh, industries are free to add details like PKPD, biomarkers, extra assessments. Uh, but uh, as a consortium, we look at it that the trial burden is kept reasonable. Uh, they are industries, sponsors are free to prioritize primary outcome measure or make a composite and they have to make a statistical plan and look at safety and also long-term safety because it's a new drug. So we know nothing about long-term safety. The benefits for the companies, because you might think, why would the companies want to, to work with us? Uh, is that the Finishing Web Medical <coughs> Consortium is available for expertise. Uh, we are willing to be trial sites. We provide easy access to eligible trial candidates to the International Vanishing Web Matter Registry. So again, please all patients register. It helps. And um, we have give them access to control data from the shared pool of controls. So actually they need to do fewer controls. For the consortium, it means working uh, with patient advocates to help uh, represent their internet uh, interest. And we have already uh, planned also 
uh, een um, Zoom session with uh, patient advocates to talk about the trial protocols and say, what do you think? Do you think it's, this is doable? This is good. Um, we uh, uh, want to assess the preclinical evidence of the companies before agreeing to collaborate. We want to assess the final protocol, uh, both the, in, the obligatory and the unconstrained parts before agreeing. We'll, we are happy to be trial sites and execute the trial recruit patients. And um, this last point is very sensitive to me. Uh, discuss reasonable and affordable pricing when the drug is there. So what do patients and patient advocates need to do? They need to work together and to work with us because it's really important that patient advocates are uh, a partner in this. Um, so they need to be active participants in research and trial readiness. Um, so they are invited, they will be invited to participate in, uh, in the registry and fill out the questionnaire. So give us information. Uh, participate, if possible, in studies, like uh, studies on the burden of disease that we are launching and uh, on study endpoints, but also help us with advisory boards. So, for instance, the Guanabens trial is uh, also governed by uh, uh, patient advocates, and we meet on, uh, on the Guanabens trial every half year online. We need them as in the monitoring board also for uh, the registry and uh, for making decisions. So it's uh, patient and patient advocates are very important for us and also to help fundraising. So this is my talk. And I have to, of course, to thank a lot of people. I have to thank patients and families who have been working with us for, uh, I would say 30 years now. Uh, I'm grateful to patient advocacy groups who also have helped funding research. Uh, I have to be grateful to clinical colleagues, especially Nicole Wolf and Mark Engelen, both are here. So in Amsterdam, we have three liquid dystrophy uh, neurologists. I have a team of PIs in the laboratory of the Amsterdam Liquid Dystrophy Center, and you can see some of them uh, here. And I'm pointing to one sitting in the back, which would be Rogier, and he will speak tomorrow on MLC. Uh, we have lovely PhD students and students, and one is sitting right here and will talk about the registry. Uh, we have numerous collaborators and contributors inside and outside Amsterdam to whom I'm grateful, funding agencies, and of course, uh, the Vanishing White Matter Consortium and the Industry Alliance Office, in particular, Priska Levering, who is now sitting there in the back and uh, who always is happy to, uh, to provide me advice. And that would be it. And I would ask, is there an urgent question or is there, shall we postpone discussion? Till the end. Yeah, I see everybody. Okay. Uh, well, I think if it's something is unclear, then we can do it now. But if there's something like a discussion on a point, we can hold the questions uh, till uh, till the end. Oh, yeah. Well, if not, then we move to the, the yeah. Does reducing the stress response preserve white matter? Um, I'm going to try to rephrase the question. Ab abnormal activation of the integrated stress response in glia cells and uh, Dr. Tesar, Tesar, um, Forgive me for not uh, pronouncing your name right, Paul, but the thing is, I asked him, how should I pronounce him? And he is also not sure himself. So <laughs> that makes it very difficult for me. But uh, the abnormal activation of the ISR in glia cells, that's what we think that drives the disease. And that would be in oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And, um, and I actually really don't know why, why this is what do you call a housekeeping factor? EIF2B is important in every cell of the body. And why then specifically the brain by matter is affected? I have no idea. I'm not sure. Do you do you have any idea, Dr. Tesar is also nodding. No. Now the next question is, is the promise of one of them preventive or would it 
or would it be effective after a huge loss of white mass? Um, what, what you have to realize is that uh, the brain is not the, the best organ in repair. If you have a, um, you know, a cut in your skin, it will nicely, you know, there will be scar tissue, but still it will be healed. In the brain, if you have an, a tumor uh, removed, the hole will be there uh, after 20 years. So the brain does nothing to fill the hole. And um, so if, if you have irreversible brain damage, it will not be repaired by anything. And so we go for stability. We go for keeping what you have. Uh, new drugs that are uh, really close to being introduced in clinics are EIF2B activators. Yeah, and I think uh, an, uh, Sigma-1 receptor agonist is also uh, close to, um, uh, to being introduced. All right, then we have somebody online, and I'd like to introduce her, uh, Elisabeth Vroom. Hey. Yeah. Elisabeth uh, Vroom is the... May I introduce you, Elisabeth? Are you there? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Elisabeth Vroom is um, a very active patient advocate. I, um, I think we met a long time ago, but then we recently met at the European Pediatric Neurology Society. She is the mother of a patient with um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and has uh, been spending a lot of her time on being active uh, representing uh, uh, the uh, interest of patients and families and working also uh, productively with regulatory agencies, which is very important, uh, and mostly with some with the FDA, but mostly with the EMA. And I was much impressed by uh, Elizabeth, the talk of Elizabeth at the EPNS, and I asked her to come and talk for you because I want you to feel, as parents, to feel empowered. You're very important. And Elisabeth is an example of, uh, of a parent who took the power. And Elisabeth, uh, I would like you to uh, talk to this audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I have to move something to make the full screen work. Yes. So there we are, right? You can see my screen, I, uh, I suppose, right? Um, so today, uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. I always love to share what we did with other groups, not meaning that what we, was, what we did is any better or whatever, but I think we all do different things. The Duchenne, I don't know if you know what it means, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, very brief, X-linked. The children are affected from birth on, but only diagnosed uh, at four and a half. There's a major diagnostic delay. They stop walking around the age of 12. The steroids is a standard treatment, part of the uh, standards of care. They need, their arm function will disappear in the late teens. They need ventilation first nocturnal and later during the day. And ultimately they die because of cardiac or respiratory uh, issues. So life expectancy has uh, improved a lot, but still it's Despite the fact that 35 years ago, already the, the gene uh, where the um, dystrophin information, that's the missing uh, protein, where the dystrophin mis uh, information is, is um, a missing. So we knew, knew in 87, I think already, what was the cause of the disease. However, till today, we don't really have a cure cure. There, are, I, I think now over 20 companies working on it and 60 trials ongoing. So there's a lot of work, but it took a long, it took much longer than we expected. Anyway, what we've learned is that patients are, can lead a transformation and of drug development. And they're transforming the future of their children, of themselves. And um, I think that is the goal of today, you know, to discuss what can we as patients, I don't know that will be clinicians in the audience as well, but I speak to the uh, patient uh, primarily, um, what can we as patients do transform the future of our families? So traditionally, it was always uh, in drug development, people use the term from bench to bed. So that means that from it started with science and at the end they would ask the patient, is this relevant to you? Do you like this product? Uh, and so on. Well, in fact, we might have to change that from bed to bench. So starting with the patient, and knowing what they need and want, and then only uh, 
put a lot of, uh, you know, uh, starting research and put a lot of effort in, in, in that. So then if you see here, I quoted uh, IR, IR Dirk. It's a super difficult acronym, but it just means the International Research uh, Consortium for uh, Rare Diseases. And also they say or state here that uh, clinical trials do not systematically measure outcomes that patients consider important or relevant. And at the end, interesting in, uh, in, interestingly enough, like EMA will ask, like, is this outcome meaningful to you? Clinically meaningful to you? Not clinically meaningful to your clinician, to the company? No, to you. So it is important that from the start on, we will be uh, uh, there and involved. So then um, if you look here, this is uh, Justus. He's my son, he's 31. He's an industrial designer. And uh, when he was in his first year, he, he was explaining me <laughs> as an industrial designer that you start, you, you don't develop a product and then at the end you ask the user, but co-creation is how you go along if you want to have a new product. So co-creation refers to a product or service design process in which input from consumers plays a central role from beginning to end. And we know that patients and consumers are not always exactly the same, but I think the idea of having patient involvement from the beginning to the end is, is important. And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, today. So, and more specific, I will speak about clinical research because of course, also in fundamental research and other things, we, we have been involved. And I also see you are funders of research. We have been doing that all. But today is really about what can we as patients do in clinical research? Well, we have to give input in trial design, in the outcome measures, in the inclusion criteria, because also I just heard, you know, what are the inclusion criteria, but realize that the inclusion criteria of a trial also define at the end, the indication or label, the EMA, for example, will give. With FDA, it's slightly different, but like if you, I will come back to that later, but if you only treat a certain group, don't think that it's, it's uh, uh, that automatically the other groups, you know, younger, older, weaker, stronger also will um, get access to that drug, that the market authorization is very tight. So there are sometimes patients have to fight or at least have to give uh, input. So uh, I come back to the data provision and sharing, but I think what is super important is that we realize um, that regulatory discussions, we are part of that. It's not, uh, last week I, I spoke to, a, a, I got a call from a rare disease group and he said to me, yes, in our annual report, we said EMA has no system to involve patients. And I said, well, really, because they have patients in every group. Yes, but they never invite us. And I said, do, you, <laughs> do they know you? And they said, uh, no, not that. So I will also come back to that later. It's important that they know you and that you show that you know what you're talking about. So my first meeting with a, a, a natural uh, authority in the Netherlands, um, so the regulator I met first, and I just, before I even could say my name, she said, so you're a patient representative. Well, you have to realize drugs are approved on data, not on emotions. So you can be super insulted by that because it's like patients only speak about emotions, but in fact, it says more about them. It says a lot about that they can handle data and have difficulties with emotion. When it's psychiatrist, it's slightly different, but be aware that whatever you want to bring uh, on the table with regulators, it is good to have it supported by a data which you have collected in a professional manner. So if you look like, what kind of data are we talking about then? You know, if, if what can we bring to the table? Well, it's the patient preference studies. I don't know if they're done in, uh, in the vanishing white matter, but in Duchenne, they are done. Um, we, the, the, we have designed relevant outcome measures. There is a community advisory board and a community advisory board speaks to the companies because um, the companies, you can't blame them for setting up trials, which are not you know, not measuring the relevant things or which are uh, too much of a burden to the patient or whatever, if you don't give them information. Companies in general <laughs> tend to pick, handpick some patients, speak to them and then say, this is what patients want. But a community advisory board, and I can't see the audience, so I don't know if you, you're nodding like we have one as well, a community advisory board. But this is a group of trained patients from different countries. And Duchenne is, I think, from 14 countries, Europe, US, Middle East, um, who uh, come together twice a year and companies can sign up 
to have half of a day with them and ask all the questions they have. That's how the, the report is not shared with anybody else and with the company, but it is very successful. They like it a lot. And also EMA says that companies who have been to the um, community advisory board are really very well uh, prepared about what uh, uh, patients want. So that's an important one. If you don't have a community advisory board, I would say start one. Um, in the regulatory process, as I said, uh, EMA has uh, patient uh, representatives in all their committees. So um, where for a specific disease, it's important to be involved in the, uh, in the scientific advice for your disease, but also like in the pediatric committee and other committees, there are patients involved. And in ethics committees, it really depends on the country. So if you think like, okay, this EMA, what about FDA? This is a paper we published, I think already two years ago, yes. And it's about the evolution of the patient-focused drug development in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So um, it's the first and last author are Americans. So FDA is there more prominent in this than the EMA, but it's absolutely worth reading how this all uh, evolved. And also how this might also be nice to have a look how we, as a community have um, quantified the caregivers' preferences for the benefit and risk of emerged, uh, emerging therapies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And you might think like, okay, but it's the caregivers. But in a an, next study we did, which was only published not so long ago, we saw that parents and caregivers are very good proxies to the patient themselves. So it's not that you think like they speak over the head of the patients. Uh, I love myself most to have the patient themselves involved, but if it's not feasible, um, the caregivers are also a good option. We looked ourselves into, we got a lot of questions at EMA, for example, about trial design with a lot of biopsies. I, you, as you can imagine, in Duchenne, uh, every muscle fiber is gold, so you don't want to have too many biopsies. In certain trials, there were five biopsies. And typically, they were done in the uh, placebo control trial, so in the phase three trial. And the interesting thing was we went back in three countries yeah, three countries to all patients who have been in trials with, um, uh, which included biopsies. And uh, what was the outcome is that patients felt that, and, and families, that the acceptability of biopsies in a trial depends on the inclusion of a placebo group, saying it's not fair to do five or four or even two biopsies in a patient who is not exposed to the drug, because then you only do it for like kind of the fake effect. Um, and you can't expect that the uh, dystrophin is, is restored. So, uh, and now it is really a subject in discussion with the EMA, if you speak about the place of uh, biopsies in, in uh, trials for Duchenne, what is the reasonable moment? And maybe the proof of principle in the phase two is already good enough, but it's really also a patient initiative. So then we had with the outcome measures, and I'm, I'm really happy you're later in the whole uh, circus, let's say, because with the outcome measures in uh, Duchenne, uh, we thought that the six minute walk test was the uh, regulator's favorite. So we thought, okay, that's fine. Six minute walk, you know, if that's what it is. And we expected that uh, that meant that if it had an uh, effect in the six minute walk test, then automatically it would also be expanded to the non-ambulatory patient, like the extrapolation, which was not the case, I can tell you. So, and then the non-ambulatory uh, group could not uh, participate in trials, while they themselves said, well, walking is highly overrated, and uh, the majority of the Duchenne patient is non-ambulant. So this was absolutely the wrong outcome measure, but it was, we, we were kind of not assertive enough. We didn't know enough. This is 20 years ago, right? But it, the six minute walk test is still in our backpack and, and causing some uh, problems here and there. So then we thought like, okay, if patients are non-ambulant, why are you not doing trials in non-ambulant patients? And they said, well, because we don't have good outcome measures in, in uh, non-ambulant patients. So we said, okay, let's go for it. We really love to overcome hurdles and bottlenecks. <laughs> so uh, we formed a working group. Uh, it was funded by our Dutch uh, organization. And what we did is we really went back to the boys themselves, but really themselves in, in terms of, we asked them just to record with a cell phone or otherwise two questions. What would you like to uh, regain if there's a drug? Is there something you would love to regain? And the other was, 
what would you like to stabilize? And we asked that to boys in different countries. So the first qualitative uh, study, let's say, and uh, I can't ask you for a hands up in the audience, like, what do you think was the outcome? But the outcome was not walking or whatever. It was being able to put my hands on the table. So if I come and drive to a table that with my wheelchair, that I'd be able to put my hands on the table because then I could still eat, type, uh, uh, scratch my head, uh, head etc. So we developed an outcome measure, which is validated, which is used a lot now. And in, in line with that um, patient report, uh, we also created a patient reported outcome measure. This patient reported outcome measure is owned by us. So we license this to uh, companies, which gives, well, a short, a little income to uh, develop new uh, outcomes again. Um, they are published. How we did it is published. So how we develop the performance of the upper limb with, uh, as I said, experts, but also uh, patient organizations. And uh, same is for the patient reported outcome measures you see in both. Also, uh, for example, my name as a patient representative, we are really part of this whole uh, process and the initiators and the funding. And this is a little bit of a sidestep, but the funny thing is that we as patients have the luxury just to think out of the box. So we thought like, if arm function is that important and being able to put your arms on the table, why not develop an exoskeleton for the arms? Because till now, exoskeletons are always developed for the legs, you know, most of them. And if walking is not the most important and there's a wheelchair for that, we, we uh, started a company. And meanwhile, we're so far that uh, six boys, no, 10 boys now are in the test phase, let's say the phase two trial of the uh, development. He can, he can now reach the uh, elevator button again so he can go out of the, the apartment they live. He can uh, play his with his Lego and um, another boy can play piano again. So as patient organizations, there are always more, there's always more to do than only uh, drugs. But the dialogue to go back to the drug develop, the dialogue with stakeholders is very important and you have to start early. So whenever there's a drug, whenever you think we are going to be in clinical trials, Try to organize a meeting with the regulators, with the patient and academics, just to discuss in the room uh, uh, what would be the best approach, how to do this. We, this is one of these articles, but we had several. Uh, Pavel Balabanov, for example, is the head of neurology in, in the EMA, and there's a, a, a scientist and there's a patient representative. So early dialogue, dialogue really matters, because if you're halfway, it's much more difficult to go back. So then there's one thing I want to give, and I always say this also in the, in the training in the summer schools. Um, we all have one goal, but we have different incentives. So if you sit around the table at a multi-stakeholder meeting, keep in mind that for scientists, it is important to produce papers. Prestige is important and career is important. That's not negative. That's not unkind. That is what it is. So keep in mind, they are not parents, they are not companies, and they are not regulators. Then for companies, they the only thing at the end matters to companies is money. You know, it's like with houses, location, 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 because they have to go back to their shareholders and justify what they've been doing. That doesn't mean that they can't be kind people, but if you sit with them at the table, realize that for them, this is above all important. And regulators, they are afraid to approve a drug that's not working, but also afraid to approve a drug that's not safe, but they don't live with the unmet need. Um, so then parents are afraid to miss the only opportunity for their child, and they don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So uh, for parents, again, they have another incentive in these discussions. So uh, I think I started five minutes or 10 minutes too late. So I have another couple of minutes, but I think what is important as patients that you have the right as parents also to fight for it, that you don't want suboptimal trials. So trials uh, that can be used for something, but not for something else. We need harmonization of EMA, FDA and HTA. There should be guidelines. We do have guidelines for Lucien. There should be a compassionate use program in place. So if trials stop, that then a wider group of patients have access to a drug, even if it's not, not or not yet uh, approved by, uh, by a regulator. And you already mentioned the, the, the use of placebo data, sharing of the placebo data. So we went for the reuse of placebo data we asked to companies. In our field, patients are in the lead of the reuse of data because we see far too much silos. Uh, I hear you speak about registries, but a registry can be 
can be a new silo again where people can't have access. And then for a patient, there's information in the registry, there's information in their health record in the hospital. So for Duchenne, uh, we build a, a Duchenne data platform, which is composed of personal data lockers where a patient can put in the data from different sources and uh, as, they, as an umbrella over these data lockers, personal data lockers. Um, there's a platform and you can extract information there. Of course, after the informed consent uh, for what can be reused, etc. And we have really in Duchenne paving the way for FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which means that data from different um, uh, sources can be compared and work uh, together. The EGRD, I don't know if, if your European Joint Project Rare Diseases is working on this, and Duchenne is there one of the groups in the lead to make sure that we handle data much better, especially in rare diseases. These are the places where we as patients can give uh, input. I've mentioned most of them already. Um, this is what you can bring in. You can bring in the preference study data, uh, what is clinically meaningful, natural history, burden of disease, burden of trial participation. And it's also important, equally important that also patients bring in uh, the standards of care and the good care centers because they know a lot about that as well. And then uh, almost last but not least, prepare yourself, do your homework, make sure uh, they know who they know you. So become a member of the EMA or uh, register as a member. And then it's one thing which is really super important and I hope you can see it if I point at it, it's the conflict of interest. So if as a patient organization, you want to be involved in regulatory processes, then you have to make sure that you have no conflict of interest at all. So patient organizations should divide part of the patients who speak with companies and another uh, uh, part of the uh, patients or experts who speak with regulators. And we call it clean and dirty, but of course it's not officially clean and dirty, but it's easy to uh, remember. It Clean is not if you don't get any money, it's just if you have given advice to a company or have been in the room with one company and not with several companies. And that sticks on you for three years. So uh, make sure you think about that, especially in rare disease where you don't have that many patients, decide who's going to EMA, who's going to the companies. For example, I'm going to, the, I'm the one at the EMA and others in our organization are speaking to the uh, companies. And uh, last but not least, EMA has patient or committee. So it's really worth to uh, join them. You can do it, I know you can do it, and maybe you do it already and I'm not aware. Eh? So I apologize uh, in advance. Please think ahead, have a radar function, learn from others. And uh, we as patients and parents can overcome hurdles, bottlenecks and challenges. And we go from having a seat at a table to saying it's our table. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Elisabeth. Uh, I enjoyed your uh, talk again. Uh, perhaps I may say something in a um, uh, first comment. I was trained to be uh, a neurologist and trained uh, to be a researcher. I had never any training uh, in, uh, you know, uh, treatment trials and uh, setting up uh, registries and things like that. It was not my job. So... Uh, in the last couple of years, I feel like I have a new career and I'm finding my way. And uh, uh, I, I hope I'm, I'm doing better over time, but I'm certainly not doing everything uh, immediately, at, um, immediately uh, as well as uh, it should be. Uh, but I think I'm finding my way and I look at my families. I think they also are finding their way and your, your talk helps a lot because we have to find our way uh, together uh, to make it all happen. And I Thank you so much. But I, I see a question here. Am I supposed to uh, um, respond to that one now uh, or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah you, see, you see a question in the chat? Can you? Can you yeah, I see it. Yeah, okay. it's, it's Erika asking, do you think it would be helpful if all individual nonprofits that fundraise and advocates unite as one? I think that's fantastic. Uh, I must honestly say that we have the World Duchenne Organization, and that is, uh, uh, I have to say it right, 53 organizations, 39 countries. However, um, funding together has proven to be difficult. And we, I, I'm in this field now 
for 25, 20 years in the chair of the international, because all these organizations have a little bit uh, different uh, approaches or they only want uh, only fund nationally. However, what I think at least you should do, and that is what we do, for me, it could be more, but um, what we do is that mo most organizations who really fund research have a research coordinator. So we have a committee where the research coordinators meet each other like twice a year and discuss uh, what they're going to fund, what they want to fund, uh, and what are the things that encounters, and also they can uh, discuss with each other. And together also we set, as an international organization, kind of research agenda, but really funding together uh, works ad hoc, you know, so like do something with the Americans, do something with the UK people, um, but as a, a, a global group of funders, it's really, um, yeah, it proved to be difficult. Does that answer your question, Erika? I can't see you. So. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, Erica, it's Allison. Um, so I run the, the, my husband and I started the VWM Families Foundation and we work on that. But Erica, um, we are already doing that. So the VWM Foundation is becoming, it's going to go away and we're all going to be just the VWM Families Foundation. So Brett and I have been working on that. We've decided to combine into one organization. Brett's going to be joining the board. Uh, and really, there are very few others around, you know, we work very closely with NIRI already, and they're solely focused on funding the Australian um, research projects. So they're not really um, involved anymore in this side of things. Um, but really, that's it. So, what, so we're already doing that. And so we're going to have one organization that will represent us. And we've also started talking about together a patient advisory board so we are going to be working on that it's just a matter of kind of you know there's been a few other things grant proposals and things like that that we've been working on um brett and you know the two organizations so once we kind of get him on the board we'll start working on that you you come in and out a little bit but i understand that you are indeed trying to or on a larger scale um uh, trying to put the funds together i think in duchenne we only already have 60 foundation only in the US. So, uh, so many different families. And then we have also AFM in Europe who raises like a uh, hundred million per year. So also the size of these organizations is so different that it doesn't- Yeah, always... it, we are a much, much smaller patient population. And there's only two organizations in the US. And now there's only going to be one. And there yeah, aren't fantastic, any- Yeah, fantastic, fantastic, yeah. And there aren't any in Europe and there's one in Australia and that's it. Yeah, okay. But Alison, that uh, I hear your your voice, Alison. So uh, I think it's just wonderful that uh, you unite because uh, as soon as there's uh, another organization, we can say, come join. Uh, exactly. So that's why, you know, we've been talking about it for a long time. And, it, you know, logistically, yeah. we didn't do it to begin with just because in the U U.S., there's state regulations. Um, so we just decided to combine as one just to make it easier for everyone. And we're going to be, yeah. you know, probably most of the people who are at this meeting we're going to ask to join the patient advisory board because now that things are starting to happen we need to start organizing ourselves a little better and we can't do it alone like we don't have the bandwidth brett doesn't we don't um we need as much help as we can get yeah i see a question here francesco uh oh there is a so do they have a oh, in south america maybe they have something So, uh, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It was very, very, very interesting. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, I work uh, in um, like outcome measures development for rare populations and particularly like one of my interests is quality of life and burden of disease. And hearing about such a like big group of people coming from all over the world, I was curious to know how do you cope with the fact that the vast majority of the population is a non-English speaker when you try to understand what is important for families? Like, is it something that is organized into focus groups by nation? And then maybe you do a cognitive interviewing to see if uh, questionnaires that might be selected to evaluate outcome measures uh, and quality of life are understood correctly by the families considering the cultural background uh, or not. Uh, 
because my personal experience is that when we try to like do this kind of work, we are kind of biased towards uh, Western societies, particularly with uh, people that are that have English as a first language, and oftentimes the translations there is a little bit of loss in translation. And sometimes what is relevant for a population, for example, the United States, it's different from a from what is important for a population that is from Asia, for example, or from Africa. And so um, my experience is with a way smaller group of like a foundation, smaller group of people, but like hearing about 40 nations, I was curious to see what is your methodology in making sure that everybody is listened correctly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for this uh, uh, question. So in general, we do translate a lot, as, as good as we can. Also like uh, meetings uh, from Spanish to Portuguese, uh, 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 Brazilian Portuguese to Russian. But um, when it comes to uh, questionnaires, I, I fully agree with you that like, especially universities tend a lot to, to you know, do things in English. But for example, the patient preference studies, we did in, in several countries, several languages. So we translated them also in, uh, in Dutch. So, and, and in uh, Dutch is all, also half of Belgium. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we translated them also in Italian and Spanish. So we, we do have uh, opportunities to, to uh, uh, translate uh, questions. I think in general, what's the problem? And we discussed this last week at a uh, conference over uh, about gene therapy is that the equity and equality. I think that recently there was also an article in the Nature, Nature about uh, pros that you don't get, let, can I use the word lower end of the patient, the ones who are less engaged, maybe not having a computer, etc. It's more difficult, difficult. And at the same time, the even worse story is that these patients are also less involved in clinical trials. So I think we all have to stay alert on how we can be as inclusive as possible and realize we are never inclusive uh, enough. Another thing we do to, to come back to your question, um, I didn't hear your name, but I think Francesca, so that was your name, okay. Um, is that you can ask the patient organizations in the countries to collect the data in their language uh, and then report back to you in English. That is, and that are not the academic, academic ones, but these are like, for example, uh, um, if you want to have an opinion of patients, you can bring in as speaking about a larger group, then that is something we sometimes do. So we send out to our members, which are again, yeah, 39 countries, but we send it to all organizations. And then, for example, we did it now about the, the, the care needed for uh, carriers, female carriers, and then they report back what they have kind of uh, uh, collected in that country. Yeah. In their so, own. Uh, thank you so yeah. much, Elizabeth. I think uh, uh, we need to close. Uh, uh, is, uh, is that okay? And yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And yeah. thank you so much for joining. I think uh, I felt it really, uh, as an empowerment to hear you talk and also a lesson. Thank you so much. Have a good meeting the other days. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank bye, you. Bye, bye. bye bye. Bye bye. And then a question to you. Uh, we are uh, 15 minutes late. We have a break actually planned. Do you want a break or do you want just to uh, continue and then uh, um, go on with the talks? Let's have a break. Okay. Sure. Um, shall we then uh, be back at 11? Is that, would that be okay? Then can, everybody can grab a coffee or can go to the washroom, anything. Thank you so much.
All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We uh, resume after the break, and it's my uh, pleasure to announce uh, Jen. Jen, yeah, to uh, to talk on the on behalf of uh, uh, patients and families, and uh, give the families perspective. Yeah. So can I give you the microphone, and your talk is there. All right, uh, my name is Jenny and my son is Jax. He's seven years old. He has vanishing white matter disease. And um, hi everyone at home, we miss you. I really wish you were here and hopefully next year we can all be together. But um, Donna asked me to speak from the VWM family perspective to VWM families. So I've been a little bit nervous about this because I feel like I'm gonna be preaching to the choir. <laughs> But um, anyways, hopefully I can say something useful and I'm hoping that this presentation can be used as a, um, a stepping stone um, to be able to initiate conversations with our doctors and the medical experts here to um, be able to come up with action items and plans to help improve the care of our children. Because I know a lot of the time we're focused on creating the cure and the ultimate treatment um, but from a family perspective, we're dealing with children or older, older children, adult children who, you know, have problems every day that we need to learn how to manage in the meantime, while we're waiting for the ultimate treatment. And so Jax, he was diagnosed when he was about one and a half or 20 months, 20 months, I think is when we got the official diagnosis. And we came to our first conference when he was two years old. And he has had a relatively quick disease course compared to other people that I've been following online. So I think he must fall in that category of, um, would it be late infantile or early child? It's because he was showing symptoms before the age of two, he's gone pretty quickly in his decline. And 2019 was a terrible year for our family. He went from being able to man maneuver himself around in the wheelchair, crawling, um, speaking a few words, being able to use a speaking device, to by the end of 2019, after several illnesses, head injuries, hospitalizations, he had lost all trunk support, head support. Um, he lost his vision and he um, required a tracheostomy. This was just in one year. So um, that was 2019. Fortunately for us, the pandemic hit. So he's had two years of really good stability where I feel like he's been able to build back up his reserves. And there's Jax back there, actually. Hi, Jax. Jaxie. Jaxie, you say hi to mom and all the friends here. So he's doing fabulous right now. So we, when we were discharged the last time from the hospital two and a half years ago, we went ahead and enrolled in hospice. And that's something that I'll talk about as well. Um, just because he came home on a bunch of medications, he had a trach. It was just totally overwhelming. He was on a roller coaster of like highs and lows. And so it's just taken this much time to be able to figure out the meds, figure out the magic formula and combination to keep him comfortable and happy most of the time. So that's what I'm focusing on today is the things we deal with on a daily basis. Okay, so this is the silver bridge and maybe Gina knows about it, but from, it connects West Virginia or used to connect West Virginia to Ohio. It was built in 1928. In 1967, the Silver Bridge collapsed. And let me read what happened. Um, a critical link in the bridge's chain suspension system gave way. In less than a minute, 1,700 feet of the 2,200 foot span bridge collapsed and 75 vehicles dropped into the river, 80 feet below. 46 people died and dozens more were injured. 
And this was a terrible tragedy. But one positive thing that came from it was the National Transportation Safety Board conducted its first major disaster investigation and reconstructed what had happened. Until then, state and federal government officials regarded such catastrophes as largely random and unavoidable. But now they determined that the corrosion of the four decade old bridge combined with an obsolete design because it was originally built to handle Model T traffic and it was still operating in 1967. So that had caused the critical failure and inspection could have caught the issue and prevented the collapse. So from then on, they developed a system to inspect bridges and they had identified 600,000 other bridges that were built around the same time that may also be susceptible to collapse. And so they were able to put their resources into maintaining these bridges instead of dealing with the emergency of when it collapses. So I like this quote right here. It says, around the same time, well, the investigation of the 1967 Silver Bridge collapse marked an advance in our ability to shift from reacting to bridge catastrophes to anticipating and averting them. Around the same time, something similar was happening in medicine. Scientists were discovering the long-term health significance of high blood pressure, diabetes, and other conditions. We'd begun collecting the data, developing the computational capacity to decode the patterns, and discovering the treatments that could change them. Seemingly random events were becoming open to prediction and alteration. And so I have noticed, and I'm hoping as we collect more data regarding VWM patients and their clinical course, that we can begin to anticipate and predict the things that they will go through and hopefully be able to mitigate some of the pain and the damage that can occur. So I'm thinking like, you know, bridge inspections. And on an ongoing basis, we can, um, oh, I didn't, how did that not change? So anyways, you know, from a uh, parent perspective, it'd be nice to be able to get a view of your child every so often and evaluate them for, you know, some of these risks that we know are coming and be able to mitigate them so that they aren't as serious later on. So one of the things we learned from Dr. Vandernap, which I really, really appreciated, and you'll have to tell me, you've noticed a big difference in lifespan of VWM patients once you told everyone to treat fevers, um, to avoid head bounce and protect their head injury. How, how much of a difference do you think that's made? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think it helps avoid the, uh, the episodes. And what we showed in the natural history studies that there are two factors that are uh, bad predictors in the disease progression. And those are epilepsy, so seizures. And uh, I see you nodding and, um, and episodes. Mm -hmm. And those are the two bad. So aside from there's a correlation between age of onset and disease progression. But if you look at what's causing uh, a further deterioration, it would be seizures and uh, episodes. And the episodes can be, um, I would say, to a great extent, not completely, because you cannot avoid completely that a child falls. Uh, but a lot of things you can uh, anticipate and mitigate. And the other thing is when a seizure happens, uh, be on top of it and do everything as soon as possible to stop it. Uh, and I have the impression that uh, they did a lot for the disease, so it become more quiet. And um, it did not entirely solve the problem. So this chronic progression is ongoing, but it certainly, um, when I was working on vanishing heart matter in the 90s, it was a dramatic disease. This patient, I didn't understand it. He's having six comas, you know, in a couple of years. Uh, and that's gone away. That's totally gone away. Thank you. So she identified um, 
these episodic declines are due to activation of the stress response. And I don't understand this, but those are, that's just the terminology. So basically there's different things that cause the stress response to be activated, which in turn causes the white matter in the VWM patient to deteriorate. So we have fevers and heat stress, uh, mechanical force or trauma, so bumping your head, a virus infection, heme deficiency, which is anemia, ER stress. I'm not exactly sure what that would be. And then amino acid starvation. So I'm a very logical person and um, I used to work in IT. So I troubleshoot and I, I think really logically and methodically. So to me, when a doctor said, oh, you know, your son has vanishing white matter disease and there's no treatment and no cure. I remember at a ULF presentation, they say leukodystrophies are treatable. We can still treat the symptoms. And so in my head, I'm thinking, okay, if these episodic declines are caused by fevers and head bumps, then obviously we can do something and prevent that from happening and improve the clinical outcome of the patient. So, so already we know, let's see, go to the next slide. So after the last in-person conference, um, I worked with Dr. Vandernap on our emergency room letter. So our doctor, we're, we're from California, and I don't know of any other VWM patients in California right now. I, there may be some, but I don't know who they are. But our doctor put together this emergency room management letter about, you know, if we had to go to the ER, how we should treat the patient and watch for it because certain things that they normally don't do for the typical patient, we need to be hyper vigilant with the VWM patient, like treating a temperature, not, not, not just a high fever, but even a low grade fever. We need to be aggressive because that causes decline. Um, and since infections cause decline, even if there's no clear sign of infection, like a positive test or anything, Dr. Vandernap has advised us to use antibiotics liberally. So even if it's not clear. So for instance, we were in the hospital one time and we assumed Jack's had an infection. The, um, the ICU was trying to get a urine sample from him before they wanted to start treatment. And, you know, he'd come in, they'd check his diaper, then, and, you know, he hadn't peed yet, so they'd left, and then he'd pee, and then they'd come back, and they'd be like, oops, we missed that one, you know, and then, and then, so they'd come back later, and it's, no, 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 we don't, we don't need to wait, we don't need to be careful, we don't, there's, um, you know, some of the nurses didn't want to put a catheter in to collect the urine sample, because that would be uncomfortable for him, let's just wait, and we'll put a bag on him, no, no, let's figure out if he has an infection or not, and in the meantime, Let's start them on antibiotics. So, so it's been interesting as we've been inpatient now several times, realizing how much I have to speak up as a parent and remind them like, yes, maybe this temperature isn't considered a fever, but this is high for Jax. Jax runs at 97 point something. So 99 is concerning to me. And so I'd like to treat it before it reaches official fever. For hours. So, so amino acids is basically protein and nutrition. So our kids will decline if they're only on IV fluids. And so Dr. Vandernap has advised within 24 hours, um, they shouldn't go without eating for 24 hours. And we need to remember that this includes even at home. So I remember Jax had the flu one year really severely, and um, he wasn't eating at home, but we didn't factor in that time for amino acid starvation. We started counting when we got to the hospital. And even then, you know, it just, we were new to this. We just didn't know. And he wasn't eating for quite a while before we finally started and we put in an NG tube through his nose to be able to feed him. And the other thing is, is often once the kids are very stressed, in the hospital is that their bowels stop working. And so 
they may not tolerate food in their tummy. And so that's when we need to move to TPN, which is nutrition through your veins. And this is something that I feel like uh, the medical doctors have always pushed back on. Oh, you know, that's, it's complicated. We don't want them to lose their motility. Um, it, it has to be a specific formula. You know, we just can't give it to them right now. We need to write a prescription for it and determine what their current levels are and what we need to supplement. And so I feel like it's always taken much longer than 24 hours to get jacks onto TPN. And that's very frustrating when we have these guidelines that say, obviously this is a concern and we're not, it feels urgent, but nobody else feels the urgency. So um, that's, that's another thing, the amino acids. And then also the other thing that comes up is the anesthesia is, uh, we know is a big problem for causing decline and vanishing white matter disease. And so same thing, they, um, the doctors don't necessarily realize that it's a problem. And so we've had to be um, very outspoken and, um, and direct with them on, you know, this, these are the uh, anesthesias he cannot tolerate and that are contraindicated for his condition. So we even put on his emergency letter, we added sevoflurane, that's how you say it, which is an anesthesia, um, just so that they know. I think it's even as an allergy in his medical chart so that they don't use that. And then these three others are um, antibiotics that are contraindicated for VWM patients. So another thing that's interesting too, is we always run into the same complications whenever we had, were admitted to the hospital. And it always, always goes is he's being hydrated and then he gets like overhydrated. He starts to get swollen. He gets hyponatremia and then that just causes all sorts of problems. So another challenging thing for patients is once we're in the hospital, um, other problems that I get. And I've talked to several parents that have also had this issue when we go into the hospital. We're terrified to go into the hospital because our children always get worse before they get better. And a lot of the reasons um, that they're getting worse were seem like they were totally preventable. And and it kills me to watch um, other kids going into the hospital that haven't had experience yet, and they go through the same thing that Jax went through. And it's like, oh, you know blood from your stomach, that's, a, that's blood in there. It's not, you know, it's not old food. It's brown, you know, they have an ulcer. We shouldn't be, you know, I just see these same patterns over and over again in other, in other children as they are admitted to the hospital that the bowels stop working, you know, they get irritated, um, they start getting random fevers and just different things like that. So the point of all this is that it would, it would be nice to have really specific guidelines um, for management in the hospital. And it needs to be published somewhere where treating physicians can find it and trust it. Um, because me posting something on Facebook isn't, they're not gonna, they're not gonna give that the time of day. So that's one thing I would like to figure out as a group, um, how to get this information into the hands of physicians when they need it. Um, and then that was in the emergency room, but also on regular appointments, we need like bridge inspections. So one of the things that I would like to know are what kinds of things can we monitor to help prevent decline or just even mitigate the severity of the decline. So one of the things that often comes up in our um, Vanishing White Matter Disease Facebook group is scoliosis and curvature of the spine. And it turns out Kathy knows, um, a lot of that can be mitigated just by knowing how to position your child as they're growing and to keep an eye on that. And so you can minimize some of the complications that come from that. Another thing I noticed too, um, with the Buck family, they just decided that they're gonna give, get Sam a G-tube. And one of the things that they've been monitoring on a regular basis, so this regular inspection is weight gain and Sam hasn't been gaining weight. So it's, it's, uh, it triggers this, oh, maybe it's time to get a G-tube so that he can have the nutrition he needs. 
So, so hey, I, sorry to interrupt you. With that, yeah, go Allison. ahead. I actually just want to say something about the scoliosis, something that I've noticed, which I'd love to talk to. Again, we're going to form a patient group, I think, so we can discuss all these things. Is kids on baclofen get far worse scoliosis much faster than kids not on baclofen? Really? Yes, because it, baclofen loosens all your muscles. Yeah. Not just the muscles in your legs. So it loosens the muscles around your spine and it causes scoliosis worsen much quicker. So we yeah. need to just like families need to because all doctors put them on back and it doesn't yes. really good. Yeah. Oh, Allison, that's great. Cause I didn't, I didn't even know that. And Jax is on baclofen, you know, so it's, they're always yeah. on baclofen. So that's why we flat out refused to put him on baclofen and he gets Botox instead. And he's not in any pain or anything. And the side effects of baclofen are awful as well. But yeah. anyways, I just wanted to add that because it's something I've noticed, uh, you know, over and over over the last 10 years, that there is a strong connection between baclofen and severe scoliosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we have all of this unofficial data that, you know, different parents have been seeing as they talk with other parents, and it would just, I, we don't know how to organize it or how to, um, I don't know, tabulate it or add it up to be able to make recommendations, you know, even though it's maybe not officially in the medical literature or something. So, so yeah, so so the baclofen is is one thing with the scoliosis, and then monitoring their weight gives us a clue that okay maybe it's time to do a G tube. And we noticed over and over again patients that have received G tubes um, after they receive the nutrition that they've been missing out on. All of a sudden they have more energy, and their overall health just improves because they're being well fed. Um, another thing I was interested in because the one of the uh, uh, risk factors for decline is a um, heme deficiency or anemia. That isn't something we've talked a lot about, but as we um, put children on G-tubes, they're not necessarily choosing what they're eating. And so that has been a challenge for me um, in feeding Jax and making sure he has all the nutrients that he needs. So there's formulas you can give them, but there's also... Um, you know, like real food that you can blend up and do a blenderized diet or real food based formulas that you can get. But sometimes, you know, then we have to start monitoring, are they getting the nutrients they need to be able to do the best they possibly can? And so that would be another thing that I would like to know, what kinds of things should I be monitoring on uh, once they get a G-tube to check their nutrition levels and maybe what might need to be supplemented or what might need to be changed in their diet? And then here's a picture of Sam. There's this living with leukodystrophy care guide, which I, I was very so excited to get. Um, so it talks about all of the different issues that leukodystrophy children and patients, adults can start to develop and how to treat them. So you can see there's tone and musculoskeletal and skin issues nutrition, bowel, and urinary, urinary tract guidelines, respiratory health, and doctrine complications, and other things. So you can actually get a free copy of this by going to this website and downloading the ebook. Um, another thing to look at, which I found so helpful, and I can't remember who originally recommended this book, but Caring for children who have severe neurological impairment. So even though vanishing white matter disease and leukodystrophies as a group of diseases are extremely rare, um, a lot of the problems they have are very similar to other neurological conditions. And so that also helps us um, understand what kinds of problems to anticipate and also how to treat those problems. And so this book has been super enlightening for me. It talks about, um, all of these different whoops, categories of problems and also the different interventions and options that you have to be able to treat them or not treat them, you know? So that's, um, oh, okay, hold on. It's the, how do you say that? Cal Calipo Joy Foundation? Calliope Joy. We also, the VWM Families Foundation has hard copies if anybody wants them as well. Yes. So 
if you go to the VWM Families Foundation um, and email email them, they they have bought a whole bunch of copies and they can mail you a hard copy. Okay, so then being creative about, you know, since there's not a lot of care guidelines for Jacks and for these patients, um, I've been a little bit creative uh, for better, for worse on finding information. So things I like to look at are like multiple sclerosis because that involves a white matter. So maybe even though the disease mechanism isn't the same, maybe some of the symptoms are because it's involving the white matter disappearing. Um, another thing is for like tra traumatic brain injuries. Well, if you think about uh, white matter and when you bump your head, even though it might not be traumatic for a normal person, maybe it still has some of the same symptoms as someone who had a really severe traumatic brain injury. And maybe we can, you know, treat a concussion or something to minimize the damage or increase the odds of recovery. Another one I look at and that I, only because it's in JAXA's chart, some doctor put in cerebral palsy as a diagnosis. So that's another thing I look at, although cerebral palsy is a static condition and isn't progressive. But there's still interesting information on there, such as, you know, if they, if they lack muscle support, you know, they can still develop scoliosis and things like that. And then another one that's been really helpful for me is looking at spinal cord injuries. And there was a, um, what, what was it called? The uh, Vietnam Veterans Society or something, but they had this amazing document here that was, it's called Eat Well, Live Well with Spinal Cord Injury and Other Neurological Conditions. So it's all about um, nutrition and things to treat like gastritis and ulcers and skin conditions and um, uh, bowel maintenance and urinary retention and things like that. So that's been actually super helpful for me to refer to because, and this is also for better or worse, but the only thing I feel like I have control over with Jack's is his diet. And so that's the thing I'm always looking at to tinker with and improve. Uh, yes, I will. Okay, so five minutes. So testing and interventions. Um, this is a doctor that we saw at the hospital, a pediatrician, and he told me one of the first times we went into the hospital that one of the things we'll face with vanishing white matter disease and other um, medically complex cases is that it's a balancing act. We have to be able to recognize um, life-threatening diseases without over-diagnosing them, but they also have to manage diseases while not erring on the side of either overusing drugs or tests or under-treating patients. And so over-treatment is interventions that do not benefit the patient or where the risk of harm from the intervention is likely to outweigh any benefit the patient will receive. So, you know, sometimes if we over-treat or over-test, we come up with problems that maybe don't even exist, and then we're treating things that we don't need to treat. Um, and children who have uh, uh, SNI, which was severe neurological impairment, are also vulnerable to over-treatment as a result of good intent. It's challenging to distinguish between when something can be improved and when it is an irreversible problem. For instance, you know, if they're making, I, this is my guess, but you know, movements or something, something that's not necessarily decreasing quality of life or causing any harm, but we're trying to treat it because it's not normal, you know, but maybe it's normal for the disease. And so five questions to ask your doctor before you get any test treatment or procedure. Do I really need it? What are the risks? Are there simpler, safer options? And what happens if I don't do anything? Because that is a choice. Um, oftentimes we feel like we have to do something, but one of the best things we can do is nothing. So um, this is a case of Jack's. We were admitted for paraflu and um, they wanted to do an MRI. What would you do? Would the results of the MRI change the current plan of care? Well, this is what Anthony and I did. We knew that if the MRI showed deterioration, the doctor said it wouldn't change its treatment. So we declined the MRI because we didn't want the doctors to make any assumptions about what or was not clinically possible just because Jax had a scary MRI. So lots of times we want to avoid testing if it's not going to change the treatment plan. And this is another case um, with Michael. He was referred to an orthopedic clinic due to curvature of the spine, and the doctor suggested spinal fusion surgery to correct the spine. 
So this is something that they had to struggle with is, okay, do we want to do surgery? And the, one of the first things they asked is, what are our other options? And so one of the things that they've decided right now, they're just not going to do anything because his internal organs aren't in harm and they can manage the pain. So in this case, they've decided as a family to do nothing to treat this at this time, but that can change down the road as they continue to monitor it. So um, those are the types of decisions that families have to make. And then this is a Choosing Wisely um, website that I found that has really interesting information on it um, about from clinicians about things you should question um, from the doctor. So for instance, here's one on treating heartburn and GERD and you know when you should use drugs, when you might not need to, et cetera. Here's another one for um, brain scans for head injuries, when you might want to do an MRI versus not an MRI. So like if the, you know, if the child started having seizures or vomiting or, you know, some of these um, symptoms, then you'd want to do an MRI. But on the flip side, they're also really, patients are also really vulnerable to experience distressing symptoms that remain unrecognized and untreated. And one of the main things is pain. Pain is often frequently undertreated. And one of the challenges we have with Jack's and maybe some other parents have is that he's, he's not speaking, he's nonverbal. And so it's very difficult to decipher what is wrong when he's experiencing pain or if he even is experiencing pain. So for instance, um, one time we, when we came home from the hospital, Jax was very upset. I thought he was in pain. I pulled out the morphine that the hospice doctor gave me and I started pumping him full of morphine. And then I realized, oh, oh, your iPad stopped. You just wanted to watch another show. And so it's like, well, Jax, I'll see you in a few hours when you wake up from your morphine coma. So it's so difficult as a parent to be able to distinguish, you know, is my child in pain? Is he just upset? And so I found this to be very um, enlightening, this uh, behavior in nonverbal children who have pain. So, so that's that. And then once you figure out if there is pain, then you need to figure out where the pain is coming from. And so these are many common things that cause pain in children with severe neurological um, impairment. And then the last thing would be, I, I really encourage, especially new families, to be able to get on palliative care or hospice and to not be afraid of it. We've been discharged from hospice three times now, and it's just been super helpful, mainly in keeping us out of the hospital where we always feel like Jax gets worse before he gets better. And so they're so good at being able to let you know what your options are. And so you can make an appropriate plan of care, you know, and, and hospice especially is good at keeping you out of the hospital. For instance, you know, they can provide um, oxygen. So you know, a lot of times you go to the emergency room because, you know, their oxygen is low and they have a respiratory illness. Well, maybe you don't need to go if you have oxygen at home and a hospice doctor can prescribe antibiotics. Well, there you go. So you don't need to go to a doctor's appointment to get antibiotics. The hospice doctor can provide it. So this has been huge for our family in being able to avoid doctor visits and hospital visits, which cause a lot of stress for Jax and, and a multitude of problems. So that is it. And then one, one last slide, things I recommend, um, as Jax has become very high maintenance, um, things that have helped me to avoid going to a doctor's office, is having a pulse oximeter, you can buy a cheap one at Walgreens for $40 that just goes on your finger. So you can check, oh, his oxygen is 93. That's okay. If it starts going lower then maybe I need to take him in, or maybe he needs oxygen or like example, the, um, at home UTI test was another big thing. Cause how many times do we have to go to the doctor and collect a urine sample to find out if they have a UTI when you can just go to the drugstore and buy UTI tests yourself and test them yourself. And then if it comes up positive, then you tell the doctor, and then you know it's worth your trip if they need to get their own positive result to prescribe antibiotics. But sometimes the doctors end up trusting you anyways, and will just prescribe the antibiotics because you know, have a positive test. So those are all my thoughts, and thank you so much for your participation and listening. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny, and uh, I'm uh, really uh, touched by uh, your story. I think we uh, postponed the discussion till the end because I think there's a lot uh, to discuss. I just want to say to you, um, I recognize uh, your story and I'm 
I'm just often, I'm a doctor. I'm sad about medicine. We don't listen. We just uh, have our strong own opinion and then we overrule parents. So I'm very, uh, I would say stick as much as possible to the same doctor who knows you and, and then knows uh, what is the case. Uh, that's a good thing. And uh, may I postpone to the, uh, I see you uh, responding now. Uh, Margaret, oh. Oh, I thought, because I think, uh, but I, uh, I recognize so many things. And even in the hospital I work in, you know, they can admit a patient and not even ask me and do something really stupid. And um, so thank you so much for sharing this. And um, I think that this might be the main focus of our general discussion. So I would first like to ask Priska to tell something about uh, the Industry Alliance Office, what we do. Um, I think Priska, I have here a connector for you. I, I we do it at the end. Yeah, we do it at the end. I think it is. There's not that. Yeah. And then. Yes. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Priska Leverink, and I work for the Industry Alliance Office at Amsterdam Neuroscience. And uh, I'll be telling you something today about how the Vanishing White Matter Consortium works together with industry, which is a story of um, drug development and the challenges that come with it, but also the hope that we have uh, nowadays. So uh, I started working on leukodystrophies uh, and vanishing web matter in particular in 2012 in the lab of uh, Professor Maria van der Knaap, where I worked on stem cell models for vanishing white matter mouse models uh, with the goal to uh, improve the understanding of the disease. And after I finished my PhD in 2018, I uh, still kept working at Amsterdam Neuroscience, which is the academic research organization. Um, but I transitioned into a business development role. And um, that's a slight difference from being an academic scientist uh, doing the research, but I still am very much involved in the research and vanishing white matter disease research is still one of my largest interests. So I'm very happy to be here today. So this is actually my first time attending the ULF and also the first time I encounter families and patients with vanishing white matter disease. For, for me, it's very special to be here today and to be able to, to talk to you. Just as a, a, a reminder, I'm not here to provide updates about what the industry has in development. They will provide their own updates uh, when they are ready to do that. Uh, I'm just here to tell you how we work with industry and how much we appreciate working with industry and how important we, th we think it is. So Amsterdam Neuroscience is a research organization. We have about 1,000 researchers working on all sorts of neuroscience indications. And the Amsterdam leukodystrophy is a very large focus of us. So years ago, we realized that in order to bring new treatments to the patients, to understand the disease mechanisms better, and to improve diagnostics and biomarkers, we need to partner with biotech and pharma. Uh, however, academia and industry can speak two different languages. And even though <clears throat> Sorry, the goal is in the end the same. Uh, the road to get there uh, may have different strategic interests. So that's why we have a dedicated team of business developers who are all scientists uh, with a neuroscience background. But we also have our own uh, legal support because we understand that industries need to pretend, uh, protect their, uh, their, their um, uh, IP, their, their uh, ownership in order to bring something to the market. Uh, we have our own financial support, but we are all non-profit and we work together with industry uh, all the way from really early identifying targets for drug development 
all the way up to clinical trials. And for vanishing white matter disease, um, uh, we have started the Vanishing Web Matter Consortium. So that's uh, a group of nine neurologists spread over eight academic centers uh, in the, uh, globally, um, where we have the mission to together improve uh, patient identification, to enable biomarker studies, develop guidelines for clinical trials, and support the development of therapeutics in general. So this is our website uh, listed here. So. Uh, this is also the place where we will provide updates, for example, on new clinical trials. And um, therapy development of drug development in leukodystrophy comes with certain challenges. So, um, first of all, we want to keep in mind that the goal is to get a treatment on the market. But to get a treatment on the market, you need to do a clinical trial. And that's the aim of the clinical trial is not in itself treating patients. It is to prove safety and efficacy of a drug in a most efficient way. So that is a different question how you're going to address that. So vanishing white matter, as we all know, is a rare disease. So that means that um, the patient numbers are not so high. And we need patients, of course to generate data on the disease, but also to be able to participate in the trials. And there are some um, things that I would like to point out that I think are uh, already known to most of you. So even though the incidence is highest at the younger age, uh, we can see that the, the prevalence, the number of patients that are currently known to the Vanishing Web Matter Consortium, um, Actually, our, uh, the majority is over 16 years old. And next to that, when we look at the geographic location of where these patients are identified, you see that mainly the adult patients are identified in Europe, which uh, we think is uh, representing an underdiagnosis of vanishing white matter patients in other geographic locations. So we still have a long way to go to be able to find all the patients. Um, Another challenge that comes up is the variability and diversity of the disease. So we know that age of onset uh, correlates, uh, correlates with disease severity. So you can see that over here and also with mortal mortality. Uh, but then within the vanishing wet matter disease uh, uh, population, we see that the patients that have a, an early disease onset mostly develop motor symptoms, where patients that have a later disease presentation and onset of later, uh, they present with cognitive phenotype. So this all proposes challenges for clinical trial design. So the random, the standard random uh, placebo controlled clinical trials that the regulators like so much for their drug development programs, they are not going to be feasible for vanishing white matter. So we need to think for alternatives to prove efficacy and safety of those drugs. And the questions that come with that is, which patients can we see the best? Uh, which patients are available for the clinical trials? Because we can think of wanting to do studies in very young patients, but there are not so many patients that uh, may be available for those studies. Also looking at inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, uh, which is of course very difficult to assess who is going to be uh, showing efficacy and safety for the drug. Uh, and also the ethical aspect comes in because are you able to do a placebo controlled trial? In some patients, maybe in other patients, not. So um, these are all challenges that we work together on the Vanishing Web Matter Consortium with. Uh, but luckily, apart from challenges, we also have a lot of chances and opportunities because I think that right now in the Vanishing Web Matter Disease Research, uh, we have come in a period of a lot of hope. Uh, so for leukodystrophies in general, we think there, there are new technological developments that are very hopeful for leukodystrophies. Of course, uh, gene therapies uh, that can be either antisense oligonucleotide therapies, uh, preventing uh, the production of a, a defective protein, but also AAV gene therapy, uh, where you can introduce a healthy copy of a mutated gene, for example, but also the development of new uh, chemical compounds and small molecules, which are all based on uh, novel insights in the disease mechanism. So they result from years and years of research that has been ongoing. Uh, and next to that, in many leukodystrophies, also uh, a novel approaches to stem cell transplantations, 
are of course very promising. Um, another thing that is providing opportunities or making it more interesting or attractive to work on leukodystrophies is that the regulatory agencies such as FDA and the EMA uh, can provide benefits while you're, for example, working on an orphan drug designation or a rare pediatric drug designation, which is making it more attractive for industry to step into leukodystrophy research. And um, leukodystrophies are diseases with a very known genetic cause and are very well uh, um, uh, phenotyped and researched. So we have a lot of information on that. And some of them can be um, studied as a model or so to say a starting point for, for example, aging or for other uh, neurologic indications that are less rare. So in that case, it's becoming interesting to first perhaps focus on a leukodystrophy and the information generated in leukodystrophy research can perhaps be applied to a broader uh, scope of research. And we think that in order to get new treatments to the market, uh, collaboration is essential. So we all have a common goal treatment for leukodystrophy patients. And um, if you look at who's all involved, we can identify three, so to say, stakeholders. So of course, for the patients, it's the, it's the ultimate goal to get treated. We need new therapies for that, but they can also uh, participate and provide in this uh, uh, journey together. Uh, you can participate in trials, uh, register as a patient. We can learn from the data uh, that you are able to give us. Then academia, uh, which is us, the Vanishing of Metro Consortium, the researchers, the neurologists, um, our goal is to treat the patients. But we, of course, need uh, new therapies, uh, participating patients, and we can provide uh, advice and knowledge, for example, to industry partners. And then the industry is the group that is developing those new drugs. So they are very essential in this field. However, they cannot do it uh, without all the other two as well. So we really believe that uh, at where all these groups come together and work together on successful research, then it can lead to new treatments. So what can the Vanishing Web Metric Consortium actually provide to the industry? Well, first of all, they have a lot of information about Vanishing Web Metric Disease, and they know that because they, they know you. So um, uh, Daphne will tell you a little bit more about the Vanishing Web Metric Registry and why it is so important uh, to register. Um, there's a lot of academic research ongoing in the laboratories, um, studying disease mechanisms, looking in cell models, looking in uh, uh, mouse models. We've heard uh, already some talks today about models for vanishing white matter disease, which is very important to generate more knowledge, uh, but also, for example, to uh, improve diagnostics. So uh, the Vanishing Web Metro Consortium is very active in seeking the collaboration with industry. So not only can we evaluate existing data that has already been generated, we also offer industry to look together at your data package and complete it if we feel that there's anything missing that is needed to make the link towards the clinic. So uh, for example, we can test uh, compounds that are generated by industry in the vanishing white mouse models, or perhaps in vitro assays that are still in development. And when it comes to clinical trial design, um, the consortium can provide guidance and advice, uh, for example, on what are relevant outcomes to look at in those studies, uh, which biomarkers are um, important to evaluate, look at the trial design, uh, what, what kind of trials can we accommodate with the patients that we, uh, that we see in the clinics? And they can also be the centers for recruitment uh, for trial design. And then um, uh, last but not least, to support industry in the regulatory interactions, to really convince uh, the FDA and the EMA how important it is to come up with novel trial designs to uh, really prove efficacy of certain drugs. Because the worst thing that could happen is that you have a potentially good drug, but your study is not powered enough or uh, uh, yeah, not well designed enough to show efficacy. And then a promising drug will not be approved. And that would, of course, be a very big uh, a disappointment. So the Vanishing Web Metro Consortium, they uh, came together to write a paper about um, their uh, opinion for a therapy trial design. So um, if you want to read it, you can Google it and, and find it online. Uh, it's publicly available. 
um, and we continue uh, uh, writing uh, expert opinions uh, about what we advise for trial design. So currently, uh, this has already been shown by uh, Professor Mario van der Knaap this morning, so I will not repeat too much, but based on um, uh, the increased knowledge about the pathophysiology of the disease, um, there are certain targets that are druggable for this disease. And uh, there, of course, we all know the um, uh, guana bands clinical trial that is uh, ongoing currently, but they're also very promising eif to be activators uh, uh, in preparation. So uh, with these compounds, already very promising data in vanishing white matter mouse models have been demonstrated where uh, uh, different compounds, for example, over here, guana bands, but also activators of EIF2B in these three papers have shown that uh, they can increase the lifespan of the vanishing white matter mouse. They can improve the motor performance of the vanishing white matter mice. They can reduce the brain pathology of the vanishing white matter mice. Uh, and also the integrated stress response can be improved. So there is a lot of promise in the field for these eif to be activators. Keeping in mind, of course, that these are mouse studies and mice are not men. Uh, we are very happy that the Vanishing White Matter Consortium has uh, regular interactions with our industry partners. So we speak to all of these partners on a regular basis, uh, including uh, uh, Calico uh, and Denali. Uh, this morning, I'm not sure if people were able to attend it because it was in a parallel session with industry. Calico made some announcements on uh, future drug development plans in Vanishing White Matter disease. And all this information will also become available on the Vanishing Web Matter Consortium. We feel very grateful to be connected with Denali, fantastic partners to be speaking to. Um, another different company that we are in contact with is Invite. So Invite is stimulating uh, genetic identification of new patients. Um, they have a leukodystrophy panel. Unfortunately, they are depending on industry support to keep this panel uh, going. So to be able to new to identify uh, more patients with vanishing white matter disease, it's very important to have a genetically confirmed diagnosis. But in order to be able to do that, these are industry sponsored programs. And um, we work together with a spin-off company of uh, Amsterdam called Silix and via Silix, uh, via Amsterdam at Silix, the vanishing web matter mouse models are available for any company that has an active drug development program uh, ongoing in vanishing white matter and uh, can show us data that we feel it's really encouraging to test this in the mouse models. Then they are uh, very welcome to approach us and do this together. And furthermore, we are in contact with companies that are still uh, undisclosed, but we, we welcome everybody who has anything for vanishing white matter. So please contact us. Uh, so currently in preparation, uh, already uh, presented today by uh, Professor Mario van der Knaap is the core protocol for clinical trial design in different age groups of vanishing white matters. And it's very important that this core protocol is used by all industry partners that have drug development programs. So the reason why it is so important is because we wanna optimize, maximize the number of vanishing white matter patients that are on an active drug program and are not on a placebo treatment. And to accommodate multiple trials in a relatively small patient population, we therefore um, believe it's essential that the placebo data is shared. And you can only share the placebo data between the different industries if the trial design is exactly the same. If all the same uh, uh, measurements are taken at exactly the same stage uh, during the clinical trial. So this is why we work together uh, with industry to facilitate that. And we believe this is uh, an, an essential point uh, for drug development program in vanishing white matter. And next to that, um, uh, this core protocol also uh, has the selected outcome markers based on all the uh, uh, different disease phenotypes and ages of the patients that the consortium uh, beliefs are the most relevant ones uh, to prove efficacy. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions or suggestions uh, for industry collaborations, please feel free to send me an email and uh, we'll be very happy to connect with you. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I see no burning questions. Then I would like, thank you so much, Priska, um, to leave the discussion till the end. And I would like to announce, uh, uh, Daphne, you have heard us much. Uh, you've heard us talking much about uh, the Vanishing Web Meta Registry. And uh, as um, Elisabeth Vroom already indicated, it would be not a good idea if this would be uh, solely in Amsterdam. Uh, Vanishing Web Meta Registry, that would be a new, um, you know, uh, item. And we think, we think it should be governed by uh, the community. And also uh, there should be, you know, um, a possible possible access uh, by uh, different parties who want to see data and uh, how it should be shared. So we're working on the governance and uh, Daphne is going to talk about it. Yes. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Mario. Um, uh, it's an honor, honor to speak to you today, uh, and I would like to start with saying thank you, uh, because I'm going to talk about registries, rare disease registries, the Vanishing White Matter Registry, and um, the Vanishing White Matter Registry really relies on all the efforts done by patients and families, giving consent, sharing data, and um, also completing all the questionnaires, so we are very thankful uh, for that. Um, I have nothing to disclose, so I would like to start with a brief update on the Vanishing White Matter Registry. Uh, the registry has been uh, around for more than 15 years now, and uh, patients from all over the world are included, but, but most patients come from Europe, from North America, and from Brazil. And um, uh, almost 400 patients are included, of which 140 are currently actively participating in the questionnaires. And it is a disease-specific registry. We only include patients with a confirmed diagnosis of vanishing white matter. But it is good to realize that there is a wide variety of patients included. When we, for example, look at the age at onset, it ranges from zero to 55 years. So this is what we call a heterogeneous disease. So that uh, is important to keep in mind. So in general, what are the purposes of registries? Um, in general, we can say that registries, disease-specific registries can be used for research, for drug development, and for regulatory decision-making. And um, we believe that um, disease-specific registries should be useful for all those purposes. And why do we want those disease-specific, multi-purpose, academia and patient-led registries? I will explain that. In rare diseases, patient data are scarce and scattering this important data into several small databases, collecting all different items and um, 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 are, are used for all the different purposes is not very efficient. We feel that it is preferred to have uh, multi-purpose disease-specific registries. And those registries can contribute to uh, improving the disease management of a certain rare disease in various ways. For example, we want large databases and you only get large databases um, via international collaboration. So with the international approach, um, it creates the opportunity to, for example, reach consensus um, with experts from all over the world, with patient advocacy, advocacy groups from all over the world. You can easily collaborate with each other. Uh, you can share knowledge with each other. And larger databases will likely be beneficial for doing research, for uh, developing guidelines. And those 
large disease specific registries can also contribute to drug development and making the drug available, the regulatory aspect. And I will elaborate a little bit on that. So a new drug, we already heard about it, starts with drug development consisting of preclinical research and clinical research. And this is a very um, time consuming and also very expensive process, in particular in rare diseases, unfortunately. But after drug development, a new product needs to be authorized, which means that the EMA and uh, the FDA assesses the safety, efficacy of the new drug. And after authorization in most countries, uh, the pricing and reimbursement decision needs to be made. And for this, a so-called uh, health technology assessment needs to be performed in which uh, the cost effectiveness and budget impact is assessed. And in the Netherlands, um, yeah, this process will take another one to two years. And sometimes this really leads to a delay in drug access because, for example, the prices in um, uh, for orphan drugs might be very high. And we think that in all those uh, phases, registries can play a role. For example, in the drug development phase, we are using the Vanishing White Matter Registry to design a core protocol. So we use the data collected in the registry to do certain statistical tasks to calculate the sample sizes needed uh, uh, to um, uh, use in the trial. We use the registry to recruit patients patients for the, the trial, for example, the Granabans trial. And when, for example, a placebo controlled uh, uh, trial is not possible, you can use the natural history data to compare the treatment with. So for that, the registry can be useful as well. And also for the authorization phase, um, registries, real world data can be of additional value, in particular in rare diseases. And regulators also really like it that the field is prepared for the post authorization phase, because often when uh, uh, products for rare diseases enter the market, the evidence on the long-term safety, long-term effectiveness is still very limited. And real-world data collected in a registry can uh, help answering those questions. So what type of data is collected in the registry? In general, we collect observational cl clinical data and patient reported data. And the observational clinical data consists of MRI results, but also, for example, genetic test results. And the patient reported data is uh, basically how things are going with the patient in terms of motor function, in terms of eating and drinking, going to school, having a job, etc. And why do we send out so many questionnaires? Um, the reason is that we want to capture the disease course as accurate as possible. Only then we will be able to compare it with uh, uh, other patients, with future treated patients. So that's actually the reason. So this brings me by the privacy issue. Medical data is always uh, a personal data, which means that we as researchers, as clinicians, um, have the obligation to inform patients and families about the use of data, to ask patients and families about the use of data, so-called informed consent, and that we need to protect their privacy as good as we can. So a few measures that we took uh, include that we do not collect names, that we pseudonymize the data, that we secure, uh, that we store everything in a secure database, and we use the Custer system, uh, which is a fully qualified application for um, medical data. And we are uh, currently working on a data access policy. And when data will be uh, uh, shared, we will make sure that only um, uh, the data is shared that is strictly necessary to answer the question and only with the right contract in place. And sometimes um, uh, we need to ask informed consent again. 
And um, sometimes we receive questions about that, but this is because we it is judicially required to ask uh, informed consent again when the purposes uh, for the use of data is, changes, uh, is changed, for example. So that's the reason for that. So what are the ongoing projects with the registry? Uh, we are doing the final and three study and the final and three is a skill to measure daily functioning to, um, um, uh, based on an interview. And we're doing that in vanishing white matter and metachromatic leukodystrophy. And um, uh, we are also collaborating uh, with Job in this project, also with Francesco. Uh, we're planning to do a burden of disease study, already wrote a protocol and um, uh, um, uh, which got accepted by the IRB. And in this project, we would like to uh, study the impact of vanishing white matter on uh, patients, on families, in particular parents, partners, siblings. And uh, the other ongoing projects include the Guanabans trial and the core protocol. So what is the future of the vanishing white matter registry? We are working on uh, several things, including um, uh, making the Vanishing White Matter Consortium as a governance body. Um, we are uh, very inspired by uh, the work of Elisabeth Vroom, and uh, uh, we think we can learn a lot from the Duchenne field. So we will try to involve patient advocates uh, more. We would like to be prepared for the regulatory and health technology uh, assessment questions. So we would like to qualify our registry by regulatory agencies. And we already uh, obtained an EMA fee waiver to do the qualification procedure. And uh, last but not least, we would like to make the data available for other researchers, uh, increasing the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability of the data. Um, in particular to maximize the impact of the data collected. So to conclude, um, we think that the Vanishing White Matter Registry uh, can be a necessary data infrastructure to foster Vanishing White Matter research, drug development, and also future regulatory decision making. And uh, I cannot emphasize it enough, but we are very, very thankful to the Vanishing White Matter community, to all the patients and families that are completing the questionnaires. And uh, as Simply Red once saying, we're, we're in this together. Um, I also would like to thank the Vanishing White Matter Consortium and in particular, Mario van der Knaap. Uh, who really is the driving force behind, the, be, behind this project, and also Menno Stellingworth, who did a lot of work for the registry the past years. And if you have any uh, questions, feedback, ideas, uh, feel free to let us know, we, because we can uh, definitely learn uh, a lot. So, thanks. so much um i would like to open uh, the final discussion uh, session which includes your talk priska's talk and uh jenny's talk where's jenny jenny's talk and so um and any any other talk actually so i would like people here in the audience and people online uh to uh voice questions mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think okay. It says I think it would carry a lot of weight to have the VWM consortium develop written guidelines and recommendations so each of us can present to doctors. Um, yes, I do understand uh, the question. It's a little bit difficult. We live in different worlds. So if if doctors write something, then we have to provide evidence that uh, something is so. So if you would simply write a guideline and, and uh, publish it, it would not be accepted for publication because they would say, what's, what's the evidence? Um, I do understand that there's daily life. So I would say that the, uh, my advice would be that the uh, Vanishing Mark Matter families develop a guideline and that the consortium is happy to review it. 
And, uh, but then it remains on the family side. And, but I think, I do think it's very, very, very important. And uh, I think we are also too happy to, to then publish it on the Vanishing White Matter Consortium website. So sort of to make it official that uh, uh, consortium endorses this. Um, because um, I understand your battle that when you come in with a seizing child or they, they want to do the regular stuff, the doctors don't want to listen to you. They're like car fixers uh, who always want me out. And my father was very good in car fixing, so I'm pretty good. And when I come in, they feel like, lady, go out. It's our job. Uh, 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 we will fix the car. Uh, and that's the same for parents, I think, in ERs, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, so, uh, But I think together uh, we can work out something uh, and try to help it make more official. Yeah. Another question? No, no, it was just a comment that I... As Jenny accurately said, parents sometimes only carry so much weight with the professions having written information published would help tremendously to mainstream some treatments for our children. Yes, so I think we just uh, addressed that, that we, uh, uh, I hope I conveyed to you that I totally agree. I see the problem also myself in medicine for uh, patients who are my, I work in a department and there's 140 pediatricians. Do you think that they all listen to me? So <laughs> I'm equally frustrated. And uh, uh, so uh, we need to, to work on this. And, uh, and, and I also think uh, it helps if um, parents speak up louder because typically what we are used to is we go to the doctor and we have this attitude that the doctor should know. So we first wait for what the doctor is going to say. Uh, but if you have a very a, a, a child with a very rare disease, you know more about the disease than the uh, average doctor you meet. Uh, so you need to inform this doctor. And um, uh, so I think that's very important. A question back for you, uh, for you guys. I, I was very happy to hear that the uh, Vanishing White Matter Foundations, we have two of them in, in the United States are going to merge. Uh, are you going to make a website? Because that's also something uh, on which you can place uh, information. And uh, I think that's yeah, also something. We have, we have one yeah. right now with them very, you know, under um, you know, I, I think it's you, Alison, but you yeah, need to speak up a little bit louder. Think, is, Brett, is Brett on here? I don't think he is. Say it again? Uh, it's, it's Allison. I, think, I don't think Brett is on the call. No, he, is, um, uh, he has a family happening. Yeah. So, um, yes, we have websites, but they need a lot of work. We, we've kind of applied for some grant funding to try and get some um, an admin because, you know, as all of our families know, we have a lot going on with our kids alone um, and it's very hard to find the time to kind of do things like update the website so we are uh, you know we put in some you know for some grant funding and you know when we're looking to kind of expand um, and get get help with the kind of admin side of things but yes we're definitely going to be binding and then we're going to hopefully get more patients involved in the organization that can help with you know a lot of this sort yeah. of stuff like keeping the websites up to date and posting on social media and, and you know, raising yeah. the profile. So yeah. now that we're working together, I think that'll be a lot easier. I, I, I totally agree. And um, also when parents have a first diagnosis uh, on Vanishing White Matter, I think what they do is go online and look for information there. So if there's a website uh, of you guys as uh, families, then that's the first thing they'll see. Uh, so I think that's very, very important. And that's something like, uh, uh, that's why I wanted you to feel empowered. And that's why I asked uh, Elisabeth Vroom to talk to you, because I want you to feel that you are partners. You can also do stuff. And, Agreed. Uh, and I think, you know, until recently, there hasn't been that much besides fundraising for us to do. But now that they're starting in early stages of clinical trials, multiple clinical trials, we need to really, as families, get organized. Um, yeah. And so, and we're going to be reaching out to probably most of you who are on this call to help out, you know, and we all together, we've all got different skills. And if we work together, we can really kind of um, make a big impact. Yeah, wonderful. Very important. Other questions? There is no question. Questions here in the audience.
Okay, may I repeat the question? Okay, how can you confirm that the patient is in the registry? Then I would say uh, there's an email specifically for the registry. It's a register uh, vwm at uh, amsterdamumc.nl. If you and uh, Menno Stellingwerf is uh, managing uh, the re register email, he is very dedicated and he will typically answer you in a day. Uh, and you can say, uh, is my child in? Or uh, am I in? And uh, we look at it. And uh, he's also provide, providing, you know, we need to have informed consent. Only patients can enter with a DNA confirmed diagnosis. So we need to be able to review uh, the DNA report and things like that. But check with the email address. Can we somehow make the email address available? It's, all, it's on the, and it's also on the Vanishing White Matter Consortium website. It's there. And actually, if you if you Google, I'm a Google fan because Google knows, knows a lot more than I do. And uh, <laughs> it's sad, but true. Um, if you Google Vanishing White Matter Consortium, it's the first hit. So it's really easy to find. Yes. Super. Yes. And then I have a super face, uh, Facebook uh, page, which is uh, maintained by Donna uh, and also made by Donna. I don't have uh, no Facebook page, so, so I'm unable to access it. But uh, <laughs> are there any uh, con con uh, are there any contradictions to keep in mind when? considering the COVID vaccine for children, other than the risk of fever? Um, no, I, uh, it, it, vaccinations in general is complicated because uh, vaccinations can also uh, induce deteriorations. It's just true. The thing is uh, that I always say that um, the disease uh, itself is much more dangerous. I've lost patients to, to COVID-19 uh, COVID and I heard of patients who deteriorated over COVID-19. So I think that the risk of COVID-19 is worse than the risk of the vaccination. And you can minimize the risk of the vaccination by a schedule of antipyretics. And so you start on the day that the vaccine is going to be given and you continue um, regular uh, dosing of antipyretics for like five days or seven days. And if you do that, personally, I have not seen a deterioration on vaccination, um, but I'm not saying it's a hundred percent, but I think that, that, that helps. So I would be in favor of vaccination because COVID-19 itself is much worse. Other questions? And then we have a session, uh, in this afternoon, I think four to five. Uh, so I would say, uh, discuss amongst each other what you want to be talking about and uh, we'll just sit. So uh, that's uh, not recorded. It's just an informal discussion. I think we have that every time that the ULF meeting was there, you can ask uh, all sorts of questions. And um, are you, Jenny, are you going to be there this afternoon? Because I think your uh, contribution was very important and also has issues that we need to need, need to mention and discuss anything else uh, there is a question can Jenny's slides be made available Yes, so I would say uh, then also perhaps spread them around. They can put on uh, Facebook, uh, I think. Uh, uh, so um, um, I think what we learned from Elizabeth is be loud and public. If you are uh, shy and you don't voice uh, your opinion, nobody will listen to you. And so that's very important. Anything else? I think everybody's a little bit tired and I'm glad that we have a, a breakout session this afternoon and um, hopefully we'll be there all and I'll be there. 
and I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for staying and for your attention. And I just want to say thank you so much for doing the research and delivering such a great news to this conference, because this is, I think, the best, best conference that, that the VWM families have so far. Thank you so much.